walked by faith, not by sight. I love how calm and, you know, just the honesty that you approach every single caller that you have come in. You're not trying to, you know, get anyone mad at you or anything. Shut up! Listen. Listen. I'm going to put you on hold. Don't hang up. You're done. We're done. You're done. You're done. You're done. You're done. You're done. Oh, gosh, please. You're done. Oh, Stop. God. What the hell is your problem that you're calling about? I don't know why you're calling us. Please shut up. I swear to God, I swear to God, I swear to God, if you just quote one more person instead of actually having a discussion, I'll hang up. We cannot keep having people talk over each other back and forth or nothing gets said. Some atheist. I'm, I'm sorry? You I'm talked ready. all the way through that while I had your ass on hold? Fine. <laughs> you're done. I hung up. You're done. The conversation's over. And so goodbye. And you're done, John. You don't get on <laughs> anymore, ever. Oh, no, no, you, you got to hold it. No, 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 you're done. I just shut him down right fucking now. Hang up on his ass. You're done. You're done, John. You're done. Why the fuck did you call? There's no way I'm going to waste time explaining things like that. Why the fuck did you call? Just you are on. either a prank caller or a buffoon. I take it back. You're not a buffoon. You're insane, and you need to go get some treatment. You're done. This is absurd. Oh, God, you're done. Go away. Was that a good rant? Matt Dillahunty, born March 31st, 1969, is an American atheist activist who is the current president of the Atheist Community of Austin, a position he had previously held from 2006 to 2013. He has hosted the Austin-based webcast and cable access television show, The Atheist Experience, since 2005, and formerly hosted the live internet radio show, Nonprofits Radio. He is also the founder of and the contributor of the counter apologetics encyclopedia iron chariots and it and its subsidiary sites he is regularly engaged in formal debates and travels the united states speaking to to local secular organizations and university groups as part of the secular student alliance speakers bureau he also frequent frequently travels abroad for speaking and debating sessions Beginning in the summer of 2017, Dylan Hunty joined a speaking tour sponsored by the Peng, Pengbrone Philosophy Foundation, where he shared the stage <clears throat> with fellow atheists Sam Harris, Richard Dawkins, and Lawrence Krauss. This information is coming directly from uh, Wikipedia. Um, I did not use uh, Matt Dylan Hunty's full, full name because I've never heard him use it on YouTube, and I do want to show him some respect in this particular um, video. Uh, Matt Delahunty is, an, is also uh, a staunch evangelical atheist who uh, aggressively goes after Christians on a regular basis. And what I want to do in this documentary is I want to show people the tactics, arguments, um, and show people uh, what Matt Delahunty is really all about from a spiritual perspective. Who, what spirit is controlling him and how to debunk his ridiculous arguments. How I got from fundamentalist Christian to, um, I suppose, <laughs> the only proper word would be evangelical atheist. Um, it, it, it's hard to say that I'm just an atheist when obviously I'm, you know, perpetually on TV um, talking about why. And uh, so background, um, I was raised in a normal Southern Baptist home um, or in Missouri. My parents were were regular Southern Baptist Christian people as were my grandparents um, went to church was you know drugged to church I suppose as a little kid like a lot of people were 
And around the age of five or so, uh, at a revival meeting, I walked down the aisle along with a bunch of other people to accept Jesus into my heart because everybody wants to go to heaven. After that, you know, we had accepted Jesus as my Savior at the, about the age of five. Um, went to church regularly along with everybody else. And uh, there was a period of time in my teens where I was actually more active than my parents were. It was no longer an issue of, okay, you're getting dressed and you're going to church. Um, I was in church Sunday morning, Sunday night. Monday night was visitation. Tuesday night was, I believe, the, the youth group, or maybe that was Thursday night. Uh, Wednesday night was normal services. Basically, almost every day of the week, there was something going on. Um, and I was involved. It was, and it was completely out of choice. And we, we would, you know, not only do like summer camp, Baptist camp, whatever, or, um, we did mission outreach stuff. We would, you know, take a bus over to Illinois and help repair and rebuild an old church and, um, you know, good charitable things and witnessing and visiting with people who visited the church on Sunday. Um, and that was all important to me because, you know, there was, there was no doubt I was a, a true believer in doing what I needed to do. I was not the perfect church-going teen. I got in my fair share of trouble for all kinds of things like any other teen. Um, but to say that my, uh, my experience was atypical would be in a way right and in a way wrong. It was probably more religious um, than the average person. Um, there was a period of time in my teens where I, I kind of doubted my faith, you know, because at that time you realize, hey, I got saved at the age of five. Did I really know what I was doing? I mean, am I really saved? Did I do, did I do it right the first time? So you do it again. And I can't tell you how many Christians I've talked to who have gone through that experience multiple times. Um, you know, whoops, in, in my early teens, I recognized that, wow, I needed to do this again, or I probably should, or, you know, and, and even in, in typical Christian parlance, it's you rededicate your life, which is kind of a, a safety check to make sure you've absolutely done it right. And then they have the, the another term for, for people who fall away from their religion, and those are backsliders. And if you backslide for long enough, then it's time for another rededication. And it's this constant um, fight with reality. And the reality is that in a lot of cases, no matter how much you believe or think you believe, um, reality creeps in you're faced with the you know the harshness of life and while christians might you know attribute that sort of a trouble to the devil tempting you um from my view now it's just the nature thing is it's just human nature and interaction that creates these problems that and distractions i mean once you start a regular job after school you have less time for things in my case it was the navy i joined the navy shortly after high school because I wasn't going to have enough money to go to college and because I had been particularly um, stubborn and, and lazy uh, during... You know, when Jesus started his ministry, he said, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. He said, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. When, when John the Baptist started his ministry, it was about repentance. When the apostles preached, it was about repentance. In Acts, in Acts chapter uh, 2, verse 38, what does it say? It says, repent and be baptized, every last one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So repentance is a serious thing. And we are repenting from the fact that we have fallen short of the mark. We have, we have violated God's holy standards. We have broken his law. We have broken his commandments. We have fallen short of the mark of God. And the Bible teaches that the wages of our sin is death. The Bible says in Romans 1 that the wrath of God is, is, is being poured out upon all those who hold the truth and unrighteousness. The Bible says we have all sinned in Romans 3.23. So when a person talks about their testimony, there's always going to be a message of, I, I turned from my sins and I believe in Jesus Christ. I admit it that I was a sinner and I believe on Jesus Christ. It isn't you go to church and you listen to what the person says and then you accept Jesus into your heart. That is not the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is a false gospel message uh, perpetrated by people who typically go to church and are really emotional about the experience that they have. In the case of Matt Dillahunty, he is no different. Mantel Hunty was 
forced to go to church. And I feel so bad for him about that. But based on his own testimony, sounds like he had a feel good moment and he accepted Jesus Christ into his heart. Okay. But that's not what the Bible says in Acts 2, 37 and 38. Again, they heard the message. They were pricked at the heart and they, and, and, and they accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Is it repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. But repentance came first. They had to admit that they were wrong. So, Matthew Lahanti's testimony is flawed. And it makes me ask an important question. Why doesn't he talk about this? Jesus said, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Ask me into your heart. Welcome to uh, lesson six of Terrified to the correct response to the gospel is repentance and faith. Now, before anybody thinks I'm being overly judgmental, watch this documentary to the end. Matthew 7, 21, 23 says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the ones who does the will of my father who is in heaven. Those are going to be the ones that will be recognized as the children of God. The ones who don't will hear the scariest words ever. I never knew you. Depart from me. Matthew chapter 7, verse 23. It says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will tell me on that day, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? In your name cast out demons? and in your name do many mighty works? Then I will tell them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who work iniquity. Well, that's alarming. These people are doing mighty works in the name of Jesus. These people are Christians. So why is Christ saying, depart from me, I never knew you? The reason he's saying, depart from me, I never knew you, is because he never knew them. Remember, those who do not love do not know God because God is love. You see, the people coming to Christ in this passage are people who are saying, Look at me, Lord, I've done many mighty works in your name. Many mighty religious works. They are trying to justify themselves before Christ by saying, hey, look how religious I am. You know, I'm a great theologian. I've read the Bible a hundred times. Um, I, I, I prophesy in your name. I, I do all these great things for you, Lord. Aren't you impressed with me? And the answer is no. Christ is not impressed with you. He's not impressed with your religious works. He is not impressed with your great theology. Now that we have a solid foundation on Matt Dillahunty's conversion story to Christianity. Let's look at what happened when Matt Delahunty was challenged on this and see what he actually said out of his own mouth. Drive home brain dump today. This one will probably be pretty short. The question is, was I ever a true Christian? This was prompted by a Twitter discussion where somebody who doesn't know me or the show talking out their ass said that if I'm going to talk about Christian beliefs, I should probably understand them, and I don't. And I tried to respond, you know, I, I was a Christian for 25 plus years. Somebody chimes in with, false conversions don't count. You admitted to Ray Comfort you were never a true Christian, which is true and completely ignores all of the context of what I actually said to Ray. So I'll clarify this fairly quickly right here. The definition of what is a true Christian is wildly varied among Christians and even among people of one denomination. Baptists, Southern Baptists, Southern Baptists of this stripe, Episcopalians, Lutherans, Methodists, my friend Jerry DeWitt, whose book I'm reading right now, it's over here, actually. It's uh, Hope After Faith. Highly recommended. Jerry was a Pentecostal. One of the primary criteria of being saved, 
under his version, apostolic Pentecostalism, is speaking in tongues, which isn't a requirement under the Southern Baptist tradition that I was raised with. So what I said to Ray, which I can't quote exactly, but I've said similar things elsewhere, was that if your definition of true Christian is about somebody who believes that they are a Christian, believes that they have been saved by the risen Christ, redeemed of their sins, that they have turned from sin, that their life has been turned over to God, and that they are now a tool of the Holy Spirit to directed to live a Christ-like life and lead other people towards the light, then I was a true Christian, because that's what I believed. If your definition of true Christian is someone who is actually saved and redeemed by a risen Christ, then I fully admit that I was not a true Christian, even though I believed that to be the case at the time, admit that I was not a true Christian, even This is very important. And the reason why I'm harping on this during this portion of this uh, documentary is because it is important to understand that Matt Delahunty, when he claimed he was a Christian, never believed he was literally saved by a risen Christ, that he was actually saved by a risen Christ. If he doesn't believe that, he's not saved. In John chapter three, verse 18, it says, he who believes is not condemned. But he who believes not is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. The way a person is saved is by turning from their sins and being born again, according to John chapter 3, where it states that unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. That means the Holy Spirit was not living inside of him. According to Acts 2.38, where it says, Repent and be baptized, all of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. We know that when the Holy Ghost lives, lives inside of you, he, the Holy Spirit will give you understanding, and the Holy Spirit will cause you to understand and to be able to follow God's word. And if he doesn't have a testimony that he had the Holy Spirit living inside of him, this man could not be who he said he is. Why is this so important? Because this man spends so much time criticizing dogging and trying to destroy the very faith he claims he was part of. Many atheists will teach that Christians don't know their Bibles. One of the biggest mouths uh, out there who does this is Matt Dillahunty. On the atheist experience, Matt Dillahunty has repeatedly said that Christians don't know their Bibles. It's not just him. It's the guest, it's the guest that shows up on his shows as well. Um, they talk to us as if we've never read the Bible. They, they treat us as if we never studied the Bible uh, because uh, they focus on problem passages that they think we don't focus on. In this next clip, you're going to watch Matt Dillahunty fail at knowing the basics um, of Christian theology and what it is that we actually believe. And this is important because this same person will come and criticize you and claim that you don't know your Bibles. You jump all over the place pretty quickly. As far as a Christian thing goes, if you want to have a discussion of what true Christianity is, I'm quite qualified to be able to discuss that. I've been studying this since 1980. I do know what it is. It's what I do. That's another topic if you're ever interested in seriously. So that I got eight years on you then because... So that you don't misrepresent uh, Christianity again because you've done it a couple of times. No disrespect meant, but you have. You've misrepresented no. the issue of denominational differences. The denominational differences are in adiaphora. Do you know what adiaphora is? No. Okay. You know what a hypostatic union is? No. Communicati with your matum. The difference between justification, imputation, sanctification? No. So you're to be a preacher. Okay. These are the basics of the Christian faith. All right, let's get back into the issue of... of uh, for you, for the me, the basis of my Christian faith was the Bible. Which says that Jesus Christ is God and flesh is only one God in all existence in all place and all time. Mormons yes. say there's many gods many places many times. You can become God if you have secret handshakes, secret underwear. Honestly. Yes, and I, I, when I was a Christian, I would have agreed that Mormons weren't Christians and that Catholics were following false doctrine. Good for you. Uh, 
uh, and, and all kinds of things. I, th my foundation was the Bible. But good for you. One all of right. the things I recognize is that uh, there are different interpretations about first. So these are the basics. We're not even talking about anything that's difficult or hard. And there are some hard topics in Christendom. But if Matt Dillahunty doesn't even get the basics, why are we allowing him to mess with our faith? Why are we accepting his criticisms of the Bible when the man doesn't even understand the ABCs of the scriptures? So it should be no surprise. Jesus said in Matthew 7:15. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. We know that there's false teachers and false prophets in the last that are going to come in the last days. And we also know in Matthew 24, 11, it says, and many, false, and many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And we're always supposed to be diligent and keep our eyes open for these false teachers and these false um, prophets in these last days. Uh, why? And no wonder. For even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14. If, if people are going to teach the Bible and criticize it, we have to make them read it first. And they will try to deceive you into believing that they read it. But the fastest way to test them is to, you know, have a conversation with them and test them and ask them questions. And if they can't answer them, then all of their criticisms is not valid. For example, our job is to agree on the essentials of the faith. We can disagree on when the rapture is going to happen. What we do have to agree on is the essentials of the faith. We can disagree on the non-essentials, but a non-believer wouldn't know that. Only a true follower of Jesus Christ would know that. If God is a, a standard of absolute morality, why didn't he condemn slavery at that point and tell him, okay, no more slaves ever? Yeah. End, of st end of story. But he didn't do that. He gave him instructions for how to do it properly. And so it took secular morality. And by the way, those instructions say that you can beat them as long as you don't beat them to death. Right. Everything short of death is okay with your God. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's got to be careful, though, because the rules for who you enslave uh, are differ. And you're not supposed to enslave your fellow Jew. But if you do, um, you have to let him go after seven years. <laughs> Unless you con him by getting him married, and then he comes and says, hey, I really love my wife, um, I'd rather not leave. And, and if he says that, then now he's yours forever, and you take and you hold his ear up to the door and drive and all. I mean, you know, it's, it's good slavery like that that your Bible supports. Yeah, so, so it took secular morality uh, for us to realize that, hey, owning other humans is probably not the most moral thing you can do. Um, so just wanted to point that out. That Which is why when I continually point out that I am more moral than the God of the Bible, I'm not just using my own, you know, relative morals to make that determination. Anybody can say that. I'm saying that by sane, social, conventional standards of morality, I am more moral than the God in the, in the Old Testament. And actually, I'd say I'm more moral than the one in the New Testament, too. But, you know, I can't really comment. Oh, wait, we lost a caller. Joanne was calling to tell us that God loves us, and as soon as I mentioned that, uh, you know, I'm more moral than your God, evidently, maybe he doesn't love us anymore. Well, it, answer the question. Answer the question. Yeah, murder. If, if, you're, if, your kids, if your kids murdered somebody, that would be justification for you to lock them in the basement and torture them. The, well... I, I would have to agree with whatever the judge of the I, I, I'm not talking about I'm not talking about a reasonable application of law. I'm saying is there anything that your kids could ever do, including not loving you back, that would be justification that would you ever lock them in the basement and torture them? And neither would the Lord. No. 
He does according to your theology. And I'll say that not only am I morally superior to God, but you are as well, because you're a decent human being. Most of us are. And I'll say that not only am I morally superior to God, but you are as well, because you're a decent human being. Most of us are. And I'll say that not only am I morally superior to God, but you are as well, because you're a decent human being. Most of us are. And I'll say that not only am I morally superior to God, but you are as well, because you're a decent human being. Most of us are. I point out that I am more moral than the God of the Bible. I'm not just using my own, you know, relative morals to make that determination. Anybody can say that. I'm saying that by sane, social, conventional standards of morality, I am more moral than the God in the, in the Old Testament. And actually, I'd say I'm more moral than the one in the New Testament, too. But... You know, I can't really. The first thing I think we better do is define what morality actually is. And the definition is morality can be defined as a system of rules for guiding human conduct and principles for evaluating those rules. Two points are worth noting uh, in this definition. Morality is a system and, in, in, and it is a system comprised of moral rules and principles. Moral rules can be understood as rules of conduct which are very similar to policies. Another definition would be morals are principles and values based on what a person or, a success or a society believes are the right and proper and acceptable ways of behaving when an individual is dealing with or capable of distinguishing between right or wrong. There is basically two types of morality that's out there. One of them is a subjective morality, and that is uh, people believing that things are right and wrong based on their own personal opinion. And then it's objective moral standards where um, people believe in absolute right and absolute wrong. So um, what Matt Dillahunty was expressing was what is called uh, subjective morality, in which he believes that his personal opinion automatically overrides everyone else's. Matt Dillahunty's opinion is, is that we are more moral than God and that God is an immoral monster. And we will see that later on in this documentary. The problem with Matt Dillahunty's opinions about God or the statements that he's making about God and the statements he, that he's making about himself as, a, as being morally superior to God and saying that Christians are morally superior to God is that these things are simply based on his opinion. They are not based on anything uh, objective. It's not built on a solid foundation. He has no basis to make a claim like this. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to let S.J. Thomason give you an example of what it is that I'm talking about. Do you know if you have objective moral values and duties? Well, let me ask you this. Do you feel it's axiomatic that we value life, liberty, justice, and equity? Do you feel that's just part of the human condition, that we're searching for these objective moral standards to which we can make judgments? Well, of course we do have objective moral standards and they're grounded in God. They're not grounded in any of our desires. They're there, regardless of what we feel about them. That's how we call them objective. So the big question was, if you don't have objective moral values and standards and duties, as Matt Dillahunty claims we don't, then how do you make assessments about things such as whether the Nazis were wrong to kill the disabled people in World War II? Well, he doesn't have a standard. And so what he's going to try to do is he's going to smuggle in this idea of 
because we have preferences to better people's lives or because we have preferences for pleasure over pain or any of those kind of things that people can just sit down at the table and call on our preferences and come to an agreement. But that's just silly. What if the Nazis don't agree with your preferences uh, and your values that all individuals have value, equal value? What if you have no way to tell the Nazis with your relativist views that what they're doing in their country is wrong? You see, Matt doesn't. And so let's see where this takes Matt. We're going to watch a little clip to see where this make, takes Matt and how he gets himself out of this problem. I, what, what was the kind of... I'm not convinced they considered him outside the circle of what they considered to be human. They had a view that these were somehow inferior humans. I think they would all acknowledge they were human, just that they were somehow inferior or they're less racist. or less diverting. Yeah, yeah. race, uh, yeah. Yeah. things like, like that. Of race. So it's one of those things where people say... Because a lot of people would say Hitler was wrong about a fact there. Whereas from what I'm, I'm wondering, like, and we're getting to the issue of, is there this objective moral value to human, to humanity? And in well, sense, it, it reminds me of the people who argue that, you know, hey, slavery is really good for the slave owners. And so if you're a slave owner, you can. So when you're losing an argument, you always go to the slavery argument. <laughs> it's an old atheist trope. It's really a shame that he actually had to go to that one rather than pay attention to the topic at hand, which is the Nazis. Look at this and say, hey, slavery is a good thing because it benefits me. The problem is, is that when you look at the larger picture, it's actually not necessarily good for the slave owners. And get, beginning to recognize that uh, every member of society affects potentially every other member fundamentally changes and, and it shifts our in-group, out-group dynamic. So that when Hitler goes after the Jews for whatever religious reasons he had for whatever uh, superior, you know, uber guy well, reasons he reasons, had, yeah. Um, yeah. that's fundamentally different from whether or not killing them makes society worse or better. And it's, it's kind of this thing of, oh, this is what I think makes us better, which is independent from what actually makes us think better. Nobody, not Sam nor I nor anybody, is say, suggesting that if we begin with an agreement on well-being as a foundation, that there aren't going to be things that are, that we think we have the right answer about and find out we were wrong. See, he has this notion that we have to come to an agreement that well-being is the foundation. Now, can you imagine him approaching uh, Hitler and saying, well, listen, Adolf Hitler, let's come to an agreement that well-being is the foundation here. And so therefore, we are not going to permit you to kill the Jews. No, that doesn't work. What works is when we realize in our own moral values that we have an objective standard. OK, we can actually approach Hitler and say you're devaluing life and Jews are to be given life, liberty, justice and equity. And clearly the way that they were treated during World War II uh, was egregious and far beyond that. But unfortunately, Matt, again, with his relativistic views, has no way to actually go to Hitler other than pretending that they're going to actually get along at a bargaining table. It's absurd, crazy, downright ludicrous. At that stage, then. It would seem like instead of having World War II, we would have a symposium in which the Nazis would present their papers and others would present other papers. And then we'd have a panel and we'd discuss them and we'd try and thrash it out. Um, at, at, at what stage do you say that their vision for updating, for, for evolving, for having a master race, at, at what stage do you say that that is morally unjustified and therefore there is a just war that can be fought against them? What? I, I don't know that there's an answer for that apart from assessing the individual situations, which is what we did. See, unfortunately, Matt doesn't have an answer. Okay, so what is a fact? A fact is a statement about an actual thing that exists and can be proven true or false, observed or measured. So when we're talking about facts, these facts can't be refuted, it's the truth. And when we're talking about opinions, an opinion is a statement about an attitude or personal belief. Opinions cannot be proven or certain and Matt Delahunty's opinion that he is more moral than God is not based on any factual information it is simply based on his unproven opinion or his lack of being able to provide a way to measure how we know we would be quote-unquote more moral than God or anyone else for that matter you see our society doesn't work according to opinions we only care about the facts at the end of the at the end of the day and the fact is is that god is holy and, and because god is holy god must 
judge sinners. If he did not, he would not be holy. If he's using sound, logical, and rational reason, he would understand this. But the fact of the matter is, God is holy, and he must and he must judge sin. God has provided a way for people to not be punished uh, according to their sin, and eventually be thrown into an eventual lake of fire. So God would not be unjust for doing that. In fact, God would be. We would question God if He didn't actually do anything about evil in the world. So Matthew Hunty doesn't have a moral basis to be able to determine how another person would be more moral than another human being. And his statement earlier that he made, where he stated that human beings or most human beings are decent people and are more moral than God because they wouldn't do what Matt Dillahunty's opinion is, is throwing somebody into a basement or throwing somebody into the lake of fire. Most human beings are liars, adulterers, lustful individuals who only care about themselves. We all know this. If we, if we are honest and we take a good close look at our lives, we know that we are far from perfect and we need a lot of work and a lot of grace. But Matt Dillahunty is not willing to accept this truth or rather accept the truth about us that we have all sinned and has fallen short of the glory of God. And I'm going to allow this brother to clarify even further on why um, human beings can't possibly claim to be more moral than God. Well, first of all, Matt Dillahunty or any other person is no person that's more moral than God. How can any person be more moral than God? You take God out of the equation, first of all, and there's nothing left except opinions, whether that be individual or group opinions. Secondly, it's easy for sinners to talk down that which is holy because they are sinners. I mean, if you're evil and corrupt, who's going to speak evil of evil and corrupt things? But what do we do as human beings? We like to make God less holy than what he is, and we like to make man more righteous than what we are. That's what it's all about. That's the name of their game. Everybody's talking about what they would do, what they wouldn't do. But you give them anything that rubs against their flesh a little too hard, and you start seeing people's true character. The first thing that comes out of people's mouth so often is, well, in my book, or ah, da, 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 I would cut this person off, I would cut this. Well, yet you get mad when God cuts people off. Uh, we're just a bunch of hypocrites. Hello? Oh, hey, um, yeah, I would like to know, how do you know uh, God isn't real? Well, have you demonstrated that he is? Well, I mean, in Romans chapter 1, verse 20, it says... Captain Kirk said, what does God need with a spaceship? Yeah. Quoting the Bible's not going to get you anywhere. Human or an alien. Quoting the Bible's not going to get... No, he was the creation. He wasn't the creator. Quoting the Bible is not going to get you anywhere because you haven't demonstrated why anybody should consider the Bible to be true or authoritative. Why should I care what Romans says? It was written by prob so probably offended? Paul. Why do I care what it says? Why do you get so offended? I'm not offended. I'm asking no. a question. Really? See, because we had this conversation a little while ago where the guy assumed that atheism was this assertion that God doesn't exist, and then with a couple minutes left in the show, we get you calling in to say, how do you know God isn't real? When I've already explained that that's not what atheists are asserting, and then when I ask you, or when, when Jen asks you to clarify it, you go start quoting Bible verses as if that should carry any weight. I'm asking, why should that carry any weight? What difference does it make what the Bible says? Because it's true. How do you know? How do you know? Because I just do. It's by faith. You you just okay. Okay. So, so how, you how do you know that? How you know the Quran isn't? Is that just good. by faith too? Because it's not based on a God. It's based on. It's based on man. the same God you worship. No, it's not. Yes, it yes, is. Yes, it is. No, it's not. It absolutely yeah, it is. is. If this Have you read? The case, then do you not know the story of Isaac and Ishmael? You haven't read your Bible, have you? That's the problem. Okay, go so go read it and you'll you'll free yourself. Go read it yeah. and actually study.
So before we get started, let's get let's get this out the way. What is an atheist? An atheist is someone who is without theism. A means to be without, to be without theism, without a belief in God. It's as simple as that. So what is the definition of evidence? Evidence is the available body of facts or information indicating whether a belief or a proposition is true. So if anybody can meet the requirement for evidence, then you can clearly show that God exists. What you are about to listen to and see are various different people providing evidence for the existence of God. One more thing that I want to point out, the evidence that you're going to listen to is going to be people providing evidence. And it's going to be the kind of evidence that have convinced others that God exists. We are not trying to convince anybody. The idea is to provide evidence and to demonstrate that this has been done for a long time and that atheists are lying when they say that no one's ever provided any evidence for its existence. Bill, can the existence of God be demonstrated? Well, it all depends on what you mean, obviously, by demonstrated. I don't think there's a mathematically certain proof of God's existence that will compel belief. But I do think that there are good arguments for God's existence. That is to say, I think there are arguments that God exists that have true premises that are more plausible than their opposites and that logically imply the conclusion that there is a God. So I think there are good reasons to believe that God exists. What are some of these reasons and how would you follow the argument? Let me just list them without explaining them. One would be I think that God is the best explanation for why anything at all exists rather than nothing. Uh, another one would be that God is the best explanation for the origin of the universe at a point in the finite past. Another would be that God is the best explanation for the fine-tuning of the universe for intelligent life. Another would be that God is the best explanation for the existence of objective moral values and duties in the world. I would also argue that God is the best explanation for the historical facts surrounding the person of Jesus of Nazareth, particularly his radical personal claims, his miracles, and his resurrection from the dead. There's the famous teleological argument, which would say that the universe exhibits a complexity in its structure that cannot be attributed plausibly to either chance or to physical necessity, and that therefore this is best explained by saying it's the product of intelligent design. I would also think that the very concept of God, once it's properly understood, entails that God exists, such that it's metaphysically impossible for God not to exist. And then finally, I would say that it's possible to have a personal relationship with God and to know God personally. And that latter isn't really an argument for God's existence. It's the claim that you can know God exists wholly apart from arguments simply by having a personal and intimate relationship with God the Creator. And if you integrate all of these together, how would you describe the level of confidence that someone should have having all of that together? I think it provides a good cumulative case that would be convincing in a court of law, for example, that it makes the existence of God more probable than not. Now, this is one of my personal favorites to show people that God exists, uh, particularly to the atheist community. They, particularly Matt Dillahunty and the rest of the atheists out there, they all believe in absolute moral um, truths. For example, uh, just about, a, I would say about 100% of the people out there believe that raping little babies is wrong. That would be a moral absolute. Most women, if not all women, I would probably say all of them, believe that rape is wrong. Most atheists, if not all atheists, believe that murder is wrong and it is wrong all the time. That shows us that objective, mor that objective moral truths exist. If objective, moral, um, if objective moral values exist, then God has to exist because then there is an absolute moral law. If there is an absolute moral law, then there has to be a God that made these absolute moral laws. Atheists have a real rough time arguing against this 
because they cannot argue that in any situation, under any scenario, that raping little babies is okay. But let's entertain the idea anyway. Let's say hypothetically speaking, there was a super star destroyer flying over the earth. And they said that in order for us not to destroy your planet, you had to rape a baby. Some of you would be like, well, I would have to do what I got to do to save the earth. That doesn't take away the fact that what you're going to do is wrong. Even though doing something wrong might cause a little bit, might cause a little good, it is still wrong because the moral lawgiver said it was wrong. Okay. If it wasn't wrong, they wouldn't have to come up with a crazy scenario about a superstar destroyer getting ready to destroy the planet. One of the things I absolutely love doing with uh, atheists when I'm talking to them about morality is, is that they like to always say that God was immoral for flooding the whole earth. They even lie and say he committed genocide without really understanding what genocide was, <laughs> what genocide actually is. But whenever you hear one of them saying that, um, you know, God is wrong for flooding the earth, just ask them, is that absolutely true? And then they'll be stumped and won't know what to say to you. The bottom line is they understand that absolute moral um, values exist and that there are absolute right and wrongs. And they always argue that God is absolutely evil when they're talking about him. But we'll get to that a little bit later in the video. I just wanted to demonstrate why I know atheists like Matt Dillahunty and other atheists out there know that objective moral values exist. I like to look at the evidence for the resurrection in four categories. The first one is, did Jesus die on the cross? Was he dead? Virtually every scholar on planet Earth can see that Jesus was dead after crucifixion. We have no record of anyone anywhere ever surviving a full Roman crucifixion. Uh, even the Journal of the American Medical Association uh, published a peer-reviewed scientific medical study of the evidence for the death of Jesus and said clearly the weight of the evidence indicates that Jesus was dead even before the wound to his side was inflicted. Even the atheist New Testament scholar Gerd Ludeman says historically it's indisputable that Jesus was dead. So Jesus was dead. The second category of evidence is the early accounts we have for the resurrection. In other words, I used to think as an atheist that the resurrection was a legend, and that took a long time to develop in the ancient world. But what I learned is that we have preserved for us a creed of the earliest Christian church, a creed that is a eyewitness-based report of the resurrection of Jesus. Now, this creed has been dated back by scholars to within months of the death of Jesus within months. That is historical gold. So we've got a news flash from ancient history on the resurrection. Third category of evidence is the empty tomb. And the best evidence for that is even the opponents of Jesus implicitly admitted the tomb was empty. Because when the disciples began proclaiming that Jesus had risen, what the opponents said was, oh, well, um, the disciples stole the body. Now they're conceding the tomb's empty. They're just trying to explain how it got empty. So everybody's conceding the tomb was empty. How did it get empty is really the issue, and that goes to the fourth category of evidence, which is eyewitnesses. You know, for most of what we know about ancient history, it comes from one or maybe two sources of information. And yet, for the conviction of the disciples that they encountered the resurrected Jesus, we have no fewer than nine ancient sources, inside and outside the New Testament, confirming and corroborating the, the conviction of the disciples that they encountered the risen Christ. That is an avalanche of historical data. So you put all that together and you have a really good case for Easter. Really quick concerning eyewitness testimony. Uh, atheists will claim that eyewitness testimony is the weakest form of evidence to use uh, if you're going to determine if a historical figure actually existed. Now, this is just plain silly for a couple of reasons. The first reason is, is that usually when we determine if a historical figure existed, we need at least one or two witnesses 
to be eyewitnesses of an individual existing and jotting it down and writing down their history. This is how we know that Plato existed. This is how we know that Socrates existed. This is how we know that pretty much anybody existed. We have eyewitnesses. People have seen these people um, exist. That's number one. Number two, typically, and me and S.J. Thomason talked about this um, with Coffee and G-Man a couple of times, that we usually remember uh, the most traumatic things that happen in our lives, no matter how hard we try to forget about it or try to uh, suppress it. For example, uh, I know exactly where I was standing and what I was doing when 9-11 happened. A lot of people remember where they were during 9-11 in the same way that a lot of people would know where what would have happened uh, with Jesus and um, the empty tomb and his resurrection. When they say that um, our memory is not reliable again uh, with using this time, this type of argumentation, they would then have to have a problem with all of the archaeology that they do, uh, saying that anybody really existed at the end of the day. It's a dishonest way um, for a person to go about trying to debunk the um, resurrection. Eyewitness testimony is just as valid as any other piece of evidence there is out there at discovering if a event or a person actually existed. What is the best argument for the existence of God? Well, the best evidence for the existence of God is that without God, you couldn't prove that anything existed. You couldn't prove anything at all, in fact. Now, there are many uh, lines of evidence that people sometimes use to demonstrate the existence of God, or at least to confirm the existence of God, and I don't want to minimize any of those. Certainly, it's, it's the case that uh, the intricacies of a living cell certainly confirm God's existence. The uh, majesty of the solar system confirms God's existence. Even the effects of God in people's lives certainly are confirmation of, of God's existence. But it turns out that, that most arguments that people use for the existence of God are not 100% conclusive. And so it seems to me that the most powerful argument for God's existence is that apart from Him, we couldn't prove anything at all. You see, in order to prove things, we need laws of logic. What are laws of logic? Laws of logic are the chain of reasoning that we use, the correct chain of reasoning, to uh, come to various conclusions from certain premises, certain givens. And you see, we all know about laws of logic, and we use them every day. Even if we can't recite them, we all know them instinctively. You can't have A and not A at the same time in the same relationship, what we call the law of non-contradiction. Now, everyone uses that principle. It's, uh, it's very commonly known. And yet, you see that these laws of logic would not make sense in an atheistic universe. Why would we have these laws at all without a lawgiver? Why would the universe feel compelled to obey laws of logic if there's no God who's upholding the universe? You see, laws of logic in the Christian worldview make sense. They're a reflection of the way God thinks. And so we have these laws of logic that apply everywhere. They're universal. They don't change with time. And that makes sense because God, you see, upholds the entire universe everywhere, and God does not change with time. And so that is reflected in the way he thinks about things. And we can, in a sense, think like God, not completely, of course, but we can think in a way that is consistent with his nature because we are made in the image of God. And so we have access to these laws of logic by which we reason. Laws of nature would be another example of something that only makes sense if you take God's existence as something that is factually true. Why would we have laws of nature that the universe feels compelled to obey? Why do these laws have mathematical properties to them like E equals MC squared and F equals MA? Why is it they can be described by these simple equations that the human mind can understand? Well, that makes sense in the biblical worldview where God uh, has imposed a certain amount of order on the universe. God has made our minds and he upholds the universe in a logical way that we can understand. Laws of morality would be another example of something that really doesn't make any sense in an evolutionary atheistic universe. Why is it that we ought to behave in a certain fashion if we're just evolved animals, if the universe is just an accident? Why not make up our own laws? And of course, some people do that, and they go to jail for making up some laws that perhaps other people would say are not so good. After all, somebody might think that it's okay for him to kill someone else, but that doesn't really make it right, does it? Not at all. You see, in the Christian worldview, laws of morality make sense because, after all, there is a God who made us in his image and we're responsible to that God for our actions. And so morality stems from a Christian worldview. It makes sense in light of the biblical God. In a way, the existence of God is the easiest thing in the world to prove because, you see, it's something that everyone already knows. 
The Bible tells us in Romans 1 that everyone knows in his heart of hearts the biblical God because God has made himself manifest to everyone. God has showed, shown himself to everyone in the, in the creation, in our conscience, and so on. And so we don't have to go around and try to come up with some new argument. No, people already know God. That's not the problem. The problem is not that people don't have enough evidence for God's existence. The problem, according to scripture, is that people suppress that truth and unrighteousness. That's what Romans 1 tells us. What is known of God is made manifest in them. God has showed it to them, and yet they suppress that truth and unrighteousness because they don't want to believe in a God who is rightly angry at them for their sin, for their rebellion against him. And so you see, what our job is, is to, uh, is to show people that, uh, that they're being inconsistent. On the one hand, they're relying upon things like logic and science and morality, things that only make sense in a Christian worldview, while simultaneously denying the God that makes that worldview possible. Socrates once stated that we should follow the argument wherever it leads. When we look at the most profound question of life, does God exist? We should certainly follow his advice. When we do, we'll find evidences that show us God is real. Let's look at six proofs that show God exists. Number one, the universe must have a cause. The most fundamental law of science is the law of cause and effect. And it says that for every material effect we see, there is a cause that came before it or was simultaneous to it and that is greater than it. The universe is a material effect. So what caused the universe? You see, if you don't believe in a creator, then you have to suggest something like uh, a singularity. That's what is popular today, that there was some type of singularity that exploded in something called the Big Bang. But then when you try to get down to the bottom of what's a singularity, well, what we hear from the scientific community that suggest to us, the, the cosmologists, they say, well, a singularity was something that popped into existence from nothing. Do you know that if there ever were a time when there was nothing, that's exactly what we would have now? The idea that something popped into existence from nothing is simply not a scientific idea. You see, they're suggesting that that singularity is somehow natural, but it behaves supernaturally. They say that that singularity wouldn't have followed the laws of nature. Well, then, so what are we left with? We're left with the fact that the universe had a beginning, and it was not a natural cause. It was something above nature. It was something super nature, something supernatural. And so, when we see the material effect of the universe, we can know that there was a supernatural creator that caused the universe. Proof number two, design demands a designer. It is a truism that everybody recognizes that this universe looks designed. In fact, when we see the various different aspects of nature and we see birds and squirrels and trees and we see all of the things that they do so well, many times we as humans, we try to copy and mimic that design, but often we don't do nearly as well as the design that we see in nature. We look at the design of the human body and the human hand and the arm and the leg and the brain, and we see that those are some of the most advanced, technologically savvy pieces of equipment ever put together, and we try to mimic them and copy them, and we can't do it as well. Why? Because this universe exhibits design from the starry sky at night to the fingertips on your hand. The design is overwhelming. It's everywhere. Where does design originate? Well, what you and I both know is that when you see things that function and they're complex, that design comes from an intelligent designer. Big explosions just simply don't bring about order. They don't cause things that are functional and complex to come into existence. The design we see in the universe demands a supernatural, intelligent designer. Proof number three, life demands a supernatural life giver. You see, in the material world, we have come to understand that there is a law of biology called the law of biogenesis. 
law of biogenesis simply says this, that in this material, natural world, life comes from previously existing life of its own kind. Now, when we look at how people used to think about life, they said, no, life can arise spontaneously from non-living chemicals. And yet every single biological experiment has shown us that that simply is biologically impossible. Life doesn't arise from non-living chemicals. From where did life arise? Where did life originate if it doesn't arise from non-living chemicals? You see, the idea that there's no God suggests to us that there had to be some singularity without a cause that exploded and that explosion brought about design, which we've never, ever seen happen. And then ultimately somewhere the non-living chemicals gave rise to life, but that's biologically impossible. Life demands a supernatural creator. Proof number four, moral law demands a moral law giver. If some things are objectively morally right and other things are objectively morally wrong, then there must be a God. You see, if we evolve from primordial slime over multiplied millions of years, at what point did objective moral values arise? We don't look at a dog and say that that dog objectively morally violated some rule when he steals a bone from another dog. We don't say, hey, he violated a objective moral value. We just don't say that. But we do say that humans can perpetrate things that are objectively morally wrong, that humans can be involved in things that are morally right. If that's true, there must be a God. Proof number five, free will exists. The atheistic idea that there is no God is founded on the idea of materialism. The idea that this material world is all that there is, all that there was, and all that there ever will be. Because of that, atheism has to suggest that you as a person don't really have free will. That there is no being inside of your body or brain that is super matter. That really what's going on in your brain is just electrons bouncing around and you're the product of those bounces. And you don't really make decisions on your own. It's just the physical laws and properties going on in your brain. If you are watching this video of your own volition, then the fact of the matter is there has to be a God that can account for that free will that you as a person have. There has to be a God if there is free will. And proof number six, human reasoning. You see, we reason on a regular basis. We understand abstract ideas. If we were products of blind chance, random processes over multiplied millions of years, reasoning and the laws of reasoning simply would have no explanation. And yet we reason together on a regular basis. From where does reason arise? It's got no naturalistic, atheistic explanation. Anthony Flew, the atheist who wrote Theology and Falsification, the most popular atheistic paper for the last hundred years, the last century. In 2006, he co-wrote a book titled, There is a God, How the World's Most Notorious Atheist Became a Believer. He stated that his rule of life had always been to follow the evidence where it leads. And he said he followed that evidence. And it led him to the conclusion that there is a supernatural, intelligent God. Let's let the evidence lead us to that same conclusion. I couldn't tell you what love physically looks like because love is immaterial. I couldn't tell you what hate physically looks like because hate is immaterial. But what I can tell you is, is that love and hate can be tested and we can observe it. Therefore, love and hate exist in the same way that we can know that God exists. If there are absolute moral laws that exist where there is an absolute right and there's an absolute wrong, if there are laws of logic, if there are the laws of, of nature that go back to there having to be a supreme uh, being or a, a person who is in control of it all, 
we can conclude that God exists. It is actually illogical and unrational for a person to come to the conclusion that God isn't real after observing and hearing everything that they heard. Again, in the future, atheists will watch a video like this and will claim that no evidence has been presented in this video. That is a lie and everyone watching this video can see that. The truth is, is that uh, an honest person will say evidence has been presented and a person cannot say that it wasn't presented. Now, what you might have some people say is, is that, oh, that evidence wasn't enough to convince me. Well, that's another argument for another day. But as far as us presenting evidence, uh, we have pre we have been pre presenting evidence since Jesus rose from the since Jesus rose from the grave. So all this talk about us never providing any evidence is ridiculous. And Matt Delahunty and Matt Delahunty should stop the foolishness with saying that no one's ever presented him any evidence. Um, for what can only be described as monstrous, clearly the God you believe in is not morally good. If you had children and they betrayed you and say they slapped you in the face... Sure, would I throw them in the basement and torture them forever? No, because that's immoral and wrong. I mean, people try to claim that... No. Also try to claim that, um, you know, that uh, he's just a loving God. Well, the entire Old Testament is pretty much a comedy of God's errors and anger. He creates two people, sticks them in a garden in the most absurd situation, says, don't eat from this tree. Um, I realize that this was, he was probably a first time parent in this scenario, but I don't think, I think even the dumbest parent would know what was gonna happen there. And so he has to punish them and exile them. And then the, the whole world goes to hell shortly thereafter. And so he picks out, you know, the most righteous man and his family and decides to build a ridiculous boat, which isn't seaworthy and couldn't hold all the animals. And then he's going to flood and kill everything except for this family, uh, at least if you go for a global flood, which we know scientifically just is absurd. And no other civilization seemed to notice this global flood. So it must have been a local flood, which doesn't actually solve the problem of sin and then right after Noah you've got a couple hundred years where they do this massive population growth and they're building a tower of Babel which I don't know why a god would be a, you know even the slightest bit bothered this was clearly the mindset of these these ancient people that God lived somewhere up in the sky um, even though you know modern theologians say no that's not it at all because clearly we can you know travel to the moon uh, I don't know if we wave to God on the way past and that fails and falls apart and so then God decides instead of trying to save everybody he's just going to pick out his one favorite tribe uh, who happened to be enslaved, and I'm pretty sure they should have realized that there was a problem with slavery, um, and goes through this incredible scenario of we're going to give all these plagues, and every time Pharaoh wants to actually let them go, God comes down and specifically hardens his heart so that he can show off a bit more. I'm, oh, no, 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 I want you to let him go, but I'm not going to let you make that. He violated Pharaoh's free will. It's explicitly there. Yeah, no, no, Pharaoh, he hardened Pharaoh's heart so that he couldn't do it, gets all the plagues out of the way, then these three million Jews, for which is no evidence that they were ever enslaved in Israel or in, in uh, Egypt, there's no you know, commingling of, of, and by the way, if they held hand to hand, the number of Jews that were there, they could have stretched from Egypt to Canaan in the first place. They're led across you know, all these miracles and everything else. Miracles that would wow anybody living today they right. get to Mount Eret, Moses is gone for 40 days, and those guys say, ah, screw that God, we'll make another one. This guy can't do anything right. So you oh, believe no. in the God that supports slavery and misogyny and uh, slaughtering off the Malachites and everything else? <laughs> Malachites? Yeah, that's the same God. Um, yeah. yeah. It's, well, well, the way, the, the, the way you're putting it is, is kind of... Um, disingenuous. It's oh, not, my, it's, my it's aching God ass, it's dis... It's, no, no, no. <laughs> Let's not say that this is disingenuous. What's disingenuous is pretending that the God of the Bible is not in favor of slavery and misogyny. And genocide. And genocide. And incest. Yeah. Well, there's specific rules about oh, incest I, and who you can and can't sleep with. Father, daughter's evidently not off limits, but the rest of them are. Hey, I explained that to Lot and Moses. Right, right. right all right, so first and foremost, let's do some definitions. A misotheist. A misotheist is someone who hates God. An anti-theist. 
A anti-theist is someone who is against the belief in a god or gods, or they're against religion. Matt Dillahunty is both. His accusations and venomous attacks against God and his nature are rooted in a deep-seated hatred for God and those who follow him. If Matt was present, he would say what most atheists would say. How can I hate something that does not exist? And the answer is quite simple. Matt demonstrates his hatred for God by doing what Satan himself does on a daily basis. He deliberately lies about God's nature. He lies about God's plan. And lastly, he ridicules anyone who would follow a God he hates. Let us demonstrate one of his favorite topics to ridicule um, God about. Slavery and the Bible. After we finish, you will know Matt hates God and like his father, Satan, seeks to be worshipped like God himself. Yes, Matt wants mankind to be worshipped and, and be conformed to the image of Satan himself. Again, let us look at slavery so everyone can see how he lies about God on a daily basis. Hey, what's up, guys? Uh, this video is going to be a response to the Matt Dillahunty and G-Man discussion that had just happened recently. Um, the reason why I decided to put up this video is because I keep on hearing how Matt Dillahunty just ate G-Man alive by these uh, dishonest atheists here online. And <laughs> that is totally untrue. Um, as a matter of fact, when I watched the video, I found one point of refutation, and that was G-Man when he refuted Matt Dillahunty. Um, the majority of the time when I'm listening to Matt Dillahunty speak, he seems to be refusing to get a, be objective in the discussion to keep the heat off of him and certain uh, things that are getting brought up. And him and the lady that's in the discussion are more so trying to bring an emotional response towards the things of slavery and morality in the Bible. Uh, the very things which Matt uh, grounding in morality is, should be questioned to begin with. So um, we're going to dissect this. I'm going to try to condense this to at least 15 minutes just to try to make it not too long of a video. If anybody wants to watch the video in full, I'll leave the link in the description uh, below. So uh, let's get started. Anyway, what do you need? Now, I just want to ask you a question. This is honestly the only reason I kept getting on your case. I would like to hear out of your own mouth, why do you believe that is wrong for a human being to own another human being in of itself? I think it was a very wise decision for G-Man to open up, questioning Matt Delahunty and why he thought anything was wrong to begin with. Uh, I would have gone further as to question Matt Delahunty and what his grounding was, uh, to question anything as being good or evil. I mean, uh, we know for a fact that atheism is like jumping out of the frying pan and into the fire when it comes to morality. Um, you look at atheists, what they've done over the last century, they've done more evil and killed more people than all religion combined over the last 2,000 years. And that's a fact. We could also bring things into question, like uh, naturalistic policies that would come into uh, Matt and atheistic position combined with his evolutionary ideas and views that he holds to. Um, so, I mean, there's a lot of things that can be questioned with Matt Delahunty, which he should question, or he should answer, before we can even allow him to question anything as being good or evil to begin with. But, of course, I think that Matt Delahunty has been in enough discussions to where he understands this as well. So, what is the very first thing Matt Delahunty does? He deflects. Would you be willing to be my slave according to what the Bible says? Oh, yes, of course. Just so so, so, so I can, so if you're my slave, I can beat you then, right? Uh, yes, you can if, if I break a Mosaic law. If you no, 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 no. It doesn't say that. It just says yes, I can it beat, it, yes, it, it says I can beat you as long as you don't die within a day or two. It does say that, but according to the Mosaic law, you can't just smite them. In the very same chapter of that book, uh, it talks about how you can't smite your servant until they die. No, 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 no. No, 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 it doesn't. See, here's the thing. You don't understand your own Bible, and that's why it's so funny that you keep telling to read your Bible and do what it says. Because the verses that you cite earlier in Exodus 21 are talking about laws against other people, other Hebrews, other people who are not slaves. There's separate laws for the people who are slaves. It's very clear. You, it's like you, you stop reading at the very verse that explains this to you. So it says, if I, beat, if, I, if I strike a man and kill him, I'm to be punished. 
But we don't have enough time on your show for me to ask you to show me the verses for this. But I actually, I do. I have a Bible right well, here. We've do, got a Bible. Do you do you, do you not have a Bible? So do you not have a Bible handy? We can look at the verse. Hang on. Do you not have a Bible handy? Uh, I don't have one in front of me, but okay. I can say this. So if you why on earth me. why on earth don't you have a Bible with you? Yeah, you know, one of the things that you got on my case about is being per is me not being professional, and right now you're not acting professional right now. I, you should I, let me finish. No, hang on. I don't have to let you finish to be professional because. So I did a 35-minute video in response to your position. Have you watched it? Uh, yes, I did, and I responded to most of it. No, actually, I, well, okay. Uh, since I stopped watching your channel, what I saw as a response uh, wasn't a response to most of it because I read the Bible and I explained it. So, like okay. Exodus, and you were wrong in every point that you made. You I was. Presuppositions. You didn't give accurate biblical um, interpretations for what you were reading. You was explaining it according to how you understood it, and no one was there to challenge you on what you were saying. So, of course, you're going to. These are laws. These are codified laws. This They're not just, interpretive. This isn't just my, you know, my understanding of it. For example, in 1861, there's a rabbi, Rabbi Raphael, who justified human slavery from the Bible by saying, and I quote. Under the same protection as any other species of lawful property, that the Ten Commandments of the Word of God, and as such, of the very highest authority, is acknowledged by Christians as well as Jews. How dare you, he's saying to the people who are opposed to slavery, how dare you, in the face of the sanction and protection afforded to slave property in the Ten Commandments, how dare you denounce slaveholding as a sin? When you remember that Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Job, the men with whom the Almighty conversed, with whose names are emphatically connects his own most holy name and character of perfect upright, featuring God and eschewing evil, that all these men were slaveholders, does it not strike you that you are guilty of something very little short of blasphemy? Well, I'm not really sure what kind of slavery he's talking about. He's talking about the transatlantic slave trade. No, 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 no. I don't know what he's talking about. I'm just going by a quote that you're saying right now. So, so, the, so the transatlantic slave trade uh, is not relevant to this discussion, except that for some reason you object to that. When well, the you transatlantic go slave trade is an abomination. Okay. And I don't support it, and I don't want nothing to do with that. However, sure. So, so, so when the Bible. Gary, Gary, so when the Bible tells you to go to war with people and that when you're done, the people that you've gone to war with become your slaves and that you can own them, they are your property, which you can pass on. Now, it's very clear what Matt Delonte is trying to do here. He understands that the average layman does not understand these topics that are getting brought up and have probably not done really thorough investigations of these topics. So what he's trying to do is he's trying to do a typical tactic that I've seen from him is refuse to allow the discussion to be objective. What do I mean by that? Well, he's forcing G-Man to answer things the way that he wants him to answer it, not to allow G-Man to give full responses to what Matt Delonte asks. And whenever G-Man begins to question something a certain way or answer something a certain way that might not allow... The, uh, such a negative appearance in front of his viewers, Matt Delahunty cuts him short and refuses him to finish answering uh, the way that G-Man would like to answer for himself. Um, G-Man is only allowed to answer the way Matt Delahunty wants him to answer. It's a subjective framework framed to give the atheists that are in control of the discussion uh, the upper hand. And what's really, really important here is how uh, Matt Delahunty refuses to be objective here. I mean, he is talking about the situation of the wartime and how slaves were taken. Well, we got to understand the time. I mean, when you went to war with these nations, they would, if you did not tear them out completely, if you did not deal with them properly, they would come after you. The children that were left over and the women that were left over would come after you in the future for revenge. You had two options here if they did not want peace. You either wipe them out completely, lest they come after you and attack you. Or two, you take captive the children and the women that are left over to keep them from coming after you in the future and taking your livestock and attacking you in the future um, out of revenge. Um, we understand as well that the Bible talks about, um, I believe it was in the book of Deuteronomy, um, saying that in that heart after the Lord give you the land to possess, for my righteousness, the Lord will give you those lands to possess. But for the wickedness of these nations, the Lord will drive them out from before you. So God said clearly that the reason why God was uh, allowing this to happen to these, to these nations and was going after these nations the way that he was, was not for the children of Israel. It wasn't for them at all. It was because of their wickedness. And we know that 
uh, there were certain nations that were uh, cannibalistic. They would eat the flesh of men, the scriptures. To your children, and that you can beat them as long as they don't die within a day or two. Um, you, you're fine with all that, but you object to the transatlantic slave tr trade. Well, again, if you actually study the scriptures and look at what God condones and what he doesn't condone, you have to find out that the Hebrews are always subjective to the Mosaic law. Hebrews are, are, you moron! Gary, Gary, Hebrews are. Other people aren't. Did you not see where I read the verse that says you'll buy your slaves from the heathen who surround you? That there are different no, rules. Sure that, Hang on. Also, wait, you're not the, reading everything either. There, you're cherry picking right now. No, I'm not cherry picking. Yes, you I, are. I, in the course of that video, I read pretty much every verse that the Bible has about slavery in context. There are different rules for Hebrew slaves than there are for non-Hebrew slaves. Do you understand that? Yeah, I would like to publicly apologize for you because you didn't even nearly touch all the passages of scripture in that video touching slavery so you're making a mistake right now no uh, you didn't do that okay so, so thanks for that bald assertion from the person who doesn't have the bible in front of them i asked a question uh, I, I, are you I, aware I'm quite aware of this topic and i know you didn't even but you're not a, you're not aware of this okay so let me ask Julian does not know what he's talking about because Matt Dillahunty authoritatively dictates so because he's in control of a discussion right now to where he does not have to allow G-Man to speak. He is wrong because he says so. We've seen no demonstration. We have thus far not even heard G-Man express his side at all. This is why G-Man is wrong. Because Matt Delahanty has emotional outbursts that dictate so. Do you, are you aware that there's a difference between Hebrew servants and slaves? Yes, I do, but they're both, they're both, in the technical sense, are slaves, though. Are you aware that the rules the Bible outlines are different for the treatment of Hebrew servants than they are for non-Hebrew slaves? There are some rules that are different from the Hebrews right, than the from the Hebrew servants. Yes, like the rules in Exodus 21, where it talks about... Uh, let me get to the verse. If a man beats his male or female slave with a rod and the slave dies as a direct result, he must be punished. But he is not to be punished if the slave gets up after a day or two since the slave is his property. Okay, I'm aware of that. But you're, you're ignoring the other stuff, too, about, like, for example, if the slave were to run away, that you can't um, go get him back. I'm not ignoring you that. I'm not, why is that relevant? On the Sabbath. You're I, not talking about that stuff. You're, you're cherry-picking on all the negative stuff. That you perceive to okay. be yeah, no, calling out the negative stuff is not the same as cherry picking. And see, I'm <laughs> I think that this picture goes perfect with the uh, with the whole video that I'm putting up right now. Um, <laughs> uh, cherry picking is exactly this. It's uh, selectively choosing the most beneficial items from what is available. Um, your most beneficial and what is selective for you on your atheistic position inside is to look for what is the most negative while refusing to be objective and taking all scripture into consideration which conflicts with those accusations that you're attempting to make um, and this is exactly and rightfully called out by g-man um, that's exactly what you guys are doing and this is exactly what is so obvious with matt delahanty what he's a few refusing to do to be objective with the text does it say you, where does it say you can only beat your slaves if they break one of the mosaic laws? Well, if you back up a few verses, it says that you can't smite your servant until uh, sure. the point that he I'll back up a few verses. Also... Um, I'll back up a few verses. To where? Uh, I believe it's in verse 12 of the same, um, of the same uh, uh, chapter that you're reading. Isn't that in Exodus? Yeah, at, verse 12. Anyone who strikes a man and kills him shall surely be put to death. Right. Okay, that is, first of all, that is a law about a man which is a different category from slaves. So you can't argue uh, from the general to the specifics. The God. Well, if it says in verse 12, if you strike a man and kill him, you should be put to death. And it says in verse 21 that if you strike a, man, a slave and kill him, you should be punished. I don't know that there's a problem there. You haven't, this verse 12 doesn't in any way say, listen, listen, listen. That, no, hang on, I'm not, I'm in the mid sentence. This verse 12 doesn't in any way say what you said it says. I said, where's the verse that says you can only beat slaves if they break Mosaic law? Okay, I know that in sec from, from a secular standpoint, when you're looking at that verse, it looks like this man can just do whatever he wants with his slave. He but can. They're his property. That's what it says. He rules for him, too, and he's certain things he can and can't do. Really? He has to obey the 613 Mosaic laws, and there are a lot more than the couple that you're bringing up right now. Uh, I know about the 613 laws. Uh, so you do where now, watch what happens right here. 
Yes. Where where does it say okay, so that? What about, so how do you reconcile that with um, love your neighbor, leave love yourself? To be different from the Egyptians. They're not your neighbors. When they were slaves in the land of Egypt. These are not your neighbors. When the Bible talks about neighbors and brethren, they are talking either about fellow Hebrews or fellow Christians, depending on the thing. It's not everybody. Really? So, 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 so if the Bible's all about love your neighbors. The, the, the good Samaritan. How, how, do you, how do you reconcile that with the parable of the good Samaritan? The Samaritan was somebody that the Jews hated to death. However, how does the Good however, Samaritan story in any way, Gary how, how, Gary, Gary, how does the Good Samaritan story in any way refute this passage? Because you just said that my neighbor is a fellow Hebrew and has a life in the pit of hell. <laughs> look, at, look at Matt's face. He's like, wait, wait what just happened? <laughs> um, this is the only points of refutation that I've seen in the whole entire video between Matt Delahanty and V-Man. I'm going to end this video right now, but... um. This is the only point. The only, the only person that was refuted throughout that whole discussion was Matt Delonte. Um All Matt Delonte really did was make a lot of loud, authoritative statements, but he never really refuted G-Man in anything. As a matter of fact, he kind of was avoiding letting G-Man get out when he wanted to get out. Um, now, I noticed that when it comes to slavery... Nine times out of ten, the thing that atheists bring up is this particular passage in Exodus 21. See, the atheist will immediately proclaim, Oh, your God commands the brutal beating of slaves. Just look at Exodus 21, verses 20 through 21. Well, obviously, anyone can see through honest exegesis that this is simply not true. But unfortunately, some atheists out there really don't care to hear the truth. And it seems as if out of sheer desperation that this is where the heart of their argument against the existence of God actually is. Not that they don't have any proof that he doesn't exist, uh, uh, but the fact that they refuse to worship him. At least that's what it seems to be in, in my perspective. But with that said, let's move on to Exodus 21. Here's an, uh, again, here's another one of the, uh, the atheist's favorite verses to turn to uh, in an attempt to debunk the existence of God and also assassinate his character. Um, the slave masters beating their slaves to death. So let's look at the verse, verse uh, Exodus 21, verses 20 and 21. If a man strikes his male or female slave with a rod and he dies at his hand, he shall be punished. If, however, he survives a day or two, no vengeance shall be taken, for he is his property. Now, first of all, this is not God commanding the slaves to be beaten at all. However, we could conclude that such a thing might have happened, and if it did, it was because of the slave breaking the law. There was nothing in the text where God commanded the arbitrary beating of the slaves just because they were slaves. If they were beaten, they were beaten for the same exact reason that the slave owner would be beaten, for breaking the law. And this is made clearly evident in verses 20, parts C and D. Let's look at that part real quick. With their rod and he, that's the slave, dies at his, the slave owner's hand, he, the slave owner, shall be punished. So who does it say will be the one punished? It's talking about the slave owner. The slave owner will be the one punished for doing what? For killing the slave. Now, obviously, God commanded this law. And to back this up, let's go back and look at verses 12 and 15 of the same, in the same chapter. Verse 12 says, whoever strikes a man so that he dies shall be put to death. Now, let's look at this verse closely, okay? Whoever strikes a man, okay, says whoever, not the slave, but it says whoever, and this is pointed towards any and everyone, not just the slave, not just the slave owner, but this is talking about to both parties and for everyone outside of that, okay? Again, verse 12 says whoever strikes a man so that he dies okay this is obviously in reference to murder remember in the previous chapter exodus 20 verse 13 the sixth commandment god commanded thou should not kill well here in exodus 21 verse 12 god is reiterating that same commandment okay back to verse 12 whoever strikes a man so that he dies shall be put to death who shall be put to death the one that strikes another man and causes him to die. That's who shall be put to death. This is corporal punishment, people. Verse 15 says the same thing, not ver verbatim, but exact, but pretty much the same thing. It says, whoever strikes his father or his mother shall what? Be put to death. 
Now, having that said, should the slave of all people be above this law or separate from this law? Absolutely not. This law pertains to everyone. And let's look at another passage that very well pertains to this. Leviticus 24, verse 17, and also verses 19 through 22. Starting with verse 17 says, Whoever takes a human life, that's including the slave, shall surely be put to death. Human, referring to all people, not just a, a specific group, but it's talking about all people. Okay, verse 19 to 22. If anyone, that's pertaining to according to all people injures his neighbor according to all people as he has done it shall be done to him fracture for fracture eye for eye tooth for tooth whatever injury he has given a person shall be given to him whoever kills an animal shall make it good and whoever kills a person shall be put to death you shall have the same rule for the sojourner and for the native for i am the lord your god so the one that strikes another man and ends up killing him will what be punished and this is precisely what we see in verse 20 of exodus 21 when a man strikes a slave male or female with a rod and a slave dies under his hand he shall be punished now to further validate that these commands pertain to all those that were with israel including the slaves let's look at numbers 15 and see how it verifies that such laws included the, foreign, the foreigners and those that were slaves Numbers 15 verses 15 and 16 says for the assembly there shall be one statute for you and for the stranger who sojourns with you a statute forever throughout your generations you and the sojourner shall be alike before the Lord one law and one rule shall be for you and for the stranger who sojourns with you. Now, the atheist may say, well, he shouldn't be beating a slave in the first place. Well, the only slave I see here are those that are slave to reading into this passage that God is commanding the slaves to be treated like Kunta Kente. That's the, those are the slaves that I see. But again, it simply states that the man that kills his slave shall be punished. It does not say God commands the beating of the slaves outside the confines of the law. Now, let's look at verse 21 of Exodus 21. Verse 21 says, if, however, he, that's a slave, survives a day or two, no vengeance shall be taken for he, the slave, is his, the slave owner's property. Let me read that again without the parenthesis. It says, if, however, he survives a day or two, no vengeance shall be taken for he is his property. Now, let's look at it closely. If, however, he survives a day or two. Okay. If the slave survives what? If the slave survives a beating, the beating, according to verse 20, okay? Again, this pertains to the law that he may have broken. We can look to Deuteronomy 25, verses 1 and 2, regarding the punishment of being beaten. As a matter of fact, if you don't mind, let's real quick look at that, that the, those verses here. Verse 1 and 2, if there is a dispute between men and they come into court and the judges decide between them, acquitting the innocent and condemning the guilty, then if the guilty man deserves to be beaten, the judge shall cause him to lie down and to be beaten in his presence with a number of stripes in proportion to his offense. Now, here's another passage that clearly pertains to all people under the old covenant. Now, surely that would include slaves, right? So if a slave was beaten, this was one of the reasons they were beaten. They would be beaten not for being a slave they were not beaten arbitrarily just because they were a slave okay and there's nothing in scripture that where god commands such a thing here we're seeing that even free people are beaten for what breaking the law how do we know that they're breaking the law because a judge declared it now why would a slave again let me ask this question why would the slave of all people be separated from this law and if there is a command by God that says that slaves were under a different level of punishment, discipline, or whatever you want to call it, where is it? And I challenge any atheist out there to prevent to, to present the, the, the evidence for this, that slaves were under a different level of punishment than the free man. And I gladly await your response. Anyway, let's finish our examination of verse 21 of Exodus 21. If, however, he, the slave, survives a day or two, no vengeance shall be taken. So, 
if the slave is beaten for breaking the law and if he survives a day or two, then the slave owner shall not be punished according to this passage. Now, the atheist is going to ask, well, what if he dies three days or four days later? Will the slave owner uh, still be uh, punished afterwards? Now, I, I agree that this is a sincere question on the surface, but that doesn't take away from the fact that it's still a fallacious one to take. Why? Because it's a hypothetical question that's rooted in a fallacy called arguing from ignorance. Okay, there's nothing in the passage that gives this assertion of, that gives this assertion of, that the that the the one posing this question is is uh, 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 asserting. Okay, the atheist may try to assert that because nothing was said about him possibly dying on the third day, therefore the slave owner can get away with killing the slave. But that's not the case because nothing is said at all about the following days of the slave's survival. It simply says with no further explanation in this passage that the slave owner will not be punished for beating his slave. Now, why would the slave owner beat a slave? Again, for the same reason that other people were beaten. Deuteronomy 25 verses 1 and 2. For what? All together now, people, breaking the law. That's right. Now, let's look at this uh, closely with a hypothetical scenario. Again, let me repeat. Hypothetical scenario. We're looking at this from a hypothetical perspective. Okay? Now, let's suppose that the slave broke the law okay and whatever it was it also involved the slave master so by law the slave was to be beaten right because he broke the law right the judge orders the slave master to make the slave lie down and prepare for beating the slave master begins to beat the slave and starts losing his temper in the process you know he starts beating him more than what he's supposed to Okay, and the slave, let's say the slave is beaten so badly that, he's has to, that he has to be hospitalized. Day one, the slave is still alive but unconscious. Day two, slave still alive but still unconscious. Day three, the slave finally wakes up, a little bit groggy, but then 30 minutes later, the slave goes into shock and eventually dies. Now, what's going to happen to the slave master in this hypothetical scenario? What's going to happen to the slave master that beat him three days prior? According to verse 20, the slave master broke the law. How did he break the law? He broke the law by killing that man, by killing that slave. He is guilty of murder and is to be punished, according to verse 20. Remember verses 12 and 15. Okay, that's a universal law that pertains to all people, including the slave masters. Now, let's look at the same hypothetical scenario where the slave survives. What's going to happen to the slave master that beat him three days prior? Again, if the slave survives of this brutal beating, what's going to happen to the slave master if the slave survives this brutal beating after three days? According to verse 21, the slave master, though he was a jerk for beating the crap out of the slave, is considered free. Why? Because he did not break the law by killing the slave. Now, of course, the atheist is going to come back and say, well, that still doesn't condemn the slave owner for beating the slave. Again, there's nothing in scripture that says God commanded the arbitrary beating of slaves outside of the confines of the law. If they were beaten, they were beaten for violating a law. And also, we don't want to overlook the other passages in this very chapter that clearly point out God commanding the slaves to be set free if they underwent some permanent injuries due to being beaten. For instance, Exodus 21, verse 26 and 27 says, When a man strikes the eye of a slave, male or female, and destroys it, he shall let the slave go free because of his eye. If the slave owner knocks out the tooth of his slave, male or female, he shall let the slave go free because of his tooth. <laughs> the tooth, people, the tooth. The slave owner is commanded by God to let the slave go even if he accidentally knocks out his tooth. Even if it's the tooth that's way back in your mouth, way up in there, where nobody can see it. The slave was given freedom afterwards. Why? Nothing because it, because that's what the law that's that's the law that God commanded. Now think about it, folks. We're talking about a tooth here. One 
too. <laughs> if the slave master got carried away and ended up breaking one of the slave's arms or one of his legs, I'd understand why that, that slave should be set free. Why? Because it's going to be difficult for the slave to do anything after having a broken limb. But a tooth? How in the world does a missing tooth affect work performance? How many teeth does a slave need in his mouth <laughs> to plant seeds? How many teeth do you need to go fishing? How many teeth do you need to carry stuff for your master? So think about it, folks. Why is losing a tooth more reason to set a slave free than supposedly nearly beating him to death, hypothetically, hypothetically speaking? If God commanded that the slave be set free after being beaten and losing one tooth, don't you think that the slave master that nearly killed the slave was obligated to take care of the slave since he did not kill him or make him lose an eye or a tooth? Even more than that, referring to the end of verse 21, the slave master was also obligated to take care of the slave and make sure he was back into healthy condition because the slave was his livelihood. It would make no sense for the slave master to deliberately kill his slave since that was his money, according to verse 21. So he had to take care of the slave. If such a case actually happened, if a slave was actually beaten that badly that he, he had to, he was put out, of, put out of commission for a few days. Uh, don't you think that the slave master was under some form of obligation to take care of that slave to make sure that he's, that he's uh, eventually uh, back on his feet so he can continue to, to, to work for him? <laughs> now, the atheist is going to hear this and say, oh, my gosh, I can't believe Veckel is actually defending this stuff as a black man. Didn't he see Roots? Didn't he see 12 years as a slave? Well, yes, I've seen both films, and but none of them portray what was commanded by God in the Bible. Furthermore, and I've said this before in my previous video, and I'll say it again because it's true and because I like saying it. But anyway. If the atheist is intellectually honest and consistent with his or her naturalistic worldview, then they can't possibly have a problem with any aspect of slavery at all. Because in an atheistic worldview where morality is contingent upon consensus, which therefore makes it subjective, not objective, then it is arbitrary for the atheist to complain about any kind of slavery, be it the Old Testament slavery condoned by God or the transatlantic slave trade type of slavery commanded by sinful man. Now, let's once again go to both of these prominent <laughs> Antichrist websites and see what kind of scholarly commentary we can get. Let's see if there's any evidence at all of a thorough examination of Exodus 21 verses 20 through 21 that was done by the webmasters of these two prominent sources that we're going to look at. And yes, we are going back to the SAB, S -A -B, which stands for Skeptics Annotated Bible and evilbible.com and i do apologize every time i come across that word i just have the the sudden urge to pronounce it with a british accent evilbible.com i sound like richard dawkins a little bit don't i but anyway i digress let's start off with the skeptics annotated bible which says this about exodus 21 slowly beating your slaves to death it's okay with god if you slowly beat your slaves to death after all, they are your money. Just make sure that they survive at least a day or two after the beating. But try not to knock out their teeth or eyes. Otherwise, you may have to set them free. End of quote. Well, there you go, ladies and gentlemen. This is the scholarly criticism from Saab regarding Exodus 21 verses 20 and 21. That's it. Nothing more than just a commentary that sounds like somebody whining, which is precisely why... I find it so hard to see how anyone can take this comment seriously. I mean, it's plainly obvious that the people that put this website together are not concerned about practicing proper hermeneutics. And it should also be noted that they're simply flat out lying to people. There's nothing in a text where God commands the slaves to be arbitrarily beaten. The text does not command that it's okay for slaves to be slowly beaten to death either. They did not... You know, it, it, it's amazing to me. Didn't they just point, didn't they just read a uh, point out verse 20 where it says that the man that kills a slave shall be punished? 
So obviously you can see in the site that it's clear what their agenda is in this case. They did no uh, cross-referencing at all. And I can assure you uh, that this is done all throughout the silly site as we already looked at uh, in the previous video. And I think the reason why there are hardly any discussion on the web uh, about this particular site by scholars <laughs> is because it's, it's clearly evident to them that there's, it's utter silliness that's prevalent throughout this site. No scholar takes this site seriously. I'm sure of it. At least not one that's honest anyway. But now let's go to evilbible.com. I apologize. I, apologize. I just can't help but do it. Evilbible.com. And let's read their scholarly exegesis on this passage, this particular passage in Exodus 21. It says this, what does the Bible say about beating slaves? It says you can beat both male and female slaves with the rod so hard that as long as they don't die right away, you're cleared of any wrongdoing. End of quotes. Here we are with the same kind of whiny commentary by the makers of evilbible.com. Nothing thorough, nothing contextual, no contextual examination made at all. Actually, this site is worse than Saab, if you ask me. At least Saab went through the trouble of showing the entire chapter rather than just two verses. <laughs> but anyway, like Saab, uh, evilbible.com is also uh, showing dishonest exegesis. Again, there's nothing in all of Scripture that shows that God commands the arbitrary beating of slaves outside the confines of the law. Again, if the slave was beaten, it was for the same exact reason that the slave owners were beaten or killed. For what? All together now again, folks, for breaking the law. That's right. It's as simple as that. This is why a slave was beaten, if, if for any reason at all, for breaking the law. Now, with that said, let's answer another silly objection made by some atheists in the, in the atheist community. The question is, were the slaves punished differently than those that were free? The answer is simply no. Though the slaves may not have had certain privileges that free people had, they were still judged by the same standard as everyone else. Again, let me refer to Deuteronomy 25 verses 1 and 2. Now, from here, some atheists would immediately assert, immediately assert that my interpretation of this passage in Deuteronomy 25 is biased and other people will interpret it another way. But see, <clears throat> statements like that, uh, in my opinion, in and of themselves are arbitrary and because it simply does not give an account for whether or not my interpretation is wrong on an epistemological level. In other words, all you're doing is simply telling me that you don't agree with this interpretation because you don't like it. And because you're not able to provide an honest and valid and scholarly alternative to how this passage could or should be interpreted. The atheist that resorts to such arguments only prove their agenda, that they don't want the Bible to say uh, what it actually says, but that they want the Bible to say what they want it to say so that they have an excuse to defend God and therefore have an excuse to hate God and therefore have an excuse to deny his existence and therefore... Uh, therefore shatter the uh, the faith of those that believe in God that's another topic if you're ever interested in seriously so that I got eight years on you then because so that you don't misrepresent uh, Christianity again because you've done it a couple of times no disrespect meant but you have you've misrepresented no. the issue of denominational differences the denominational differences are in adiaphora do you know what adiaphora is no okay you know what the hypostatic union is no Communicati with your matum, the difference between justification, imputation, sanctification. No. Certainly so be a preacher. Okay. These are the basics of the Christian faith. Typically, if somebody doesn't know their ABCs and one, two, threes, we typically won't um, allow somebody like that to talk about advanced topics. In this case, uh, atheists want to talk about slavery in the Bible and how God was immoral for condoning it in the Bible. Uh, what the atheists will not be intellectually honest about is, is that these were laws... Um, as the brother Vacko pointed out, and as I pointed out to uh, Mr. Dillahunty when I called into the atheist experience, but these were laws that was made by the was that was made by the nation of Israel. Uh, in some cases, um, slavery was allowed so that restitution could take place. It was a form of punishment. It was a way for people to provide for their family. And Matt Dillahunty believes that God was immoral for doing so, without actually offering an explanation on why it's immoral. 
as we talked about earlier when it came to subjective and objective uh, morality, it's according to his own opinion. And what he does is, which is quite clever, and this is why you know the devil is behind him with this, is that what he does is, is he assumes that the two of you universally agrees that in every situation, slavery is wrong. That's kind of weird considering he's a subjectivist and he claims that there's no objective morality. But anyway, um, he he works on that and he he depends on you uh, emotionally agreeing with him rather than uh, intellectually thinking about what was actually going on in the Bible. And by doing that, he hopes to destroy your faith, to assassinate God's character and have you question your faith in Jesus Christ and to become like him. As a person who is a misotheist or an anti-theist, a person who hates God and a person who hates religion. The point of the matter is, at the end of the day, Matt Dillahunty does not have a firm grasp or a good understanding of what the Bible teaches on any topic in the Bible. He doesn't even understand the gospel and how one gets saved. We saw that earlier in this documentary. Again, if you don't know the basics, why are we listening to a person who claims he knows so much when he doesn't understand the more advanced, um, when he doesn't even understand the basic stuff, he has no business talking about the uh, the advanced stuff. So anyway, um, the one of the reasons why Matt Delahunty is um, speaking out um, against slavery in the Bible again, and it was pointed out by the brother in the video where I call the atheist experience. His name is True Empiricism, is that he desires for people to look to him for knowledge. They desire for us Christians to get our knowledge from them. They want to be worshipped. They want to be adored. They want to be venerated. They want to be lifted up above God. They lower him and they elevate themselves. If you remember in the Gospels, I believe it's in John chapter 3, uh, the apostle, I'm sorry, not the apostle, John the Baptist said that I must, I must decrease and he must increase. In the atheist worldview, God must decrease and the atheist must increase. It's, it's, it's totally backwards. It's kind of thinking that Satan has and the kind of thinking that many of the fallen angels have an atheist desire to be worshipped and the only way that's ever going to happen is if we Christians stop venerating God uplifting his name worshipping him and we stop um, lifting and we stop looking at him as being high and lifted up and we start looking at the atheists that way and they will do whatever they got to do to get this worship God is not an immoral monster and anyone can make the blanket statement and say that he's a monster or that he's good or he's great or whatever, but it must be backed by something. It has to be backed by facts and not by one's own personal opinion, which is backed by nothing. Again, when, if you listen very carefully to Matt Dillahunty's arguments, they are dependent upon you and your emotions and him thinking that you and him are going to universally agree that the things that he's talking about is is, is right. Um, the, the mistake I think a lot of us Christians make when we call the atheist experience or when we're speaking to a person like Matt Delahunty is, is we forget to make him give us a basis for what he determines to be right and wrong and to test it to see if it can stand under the scrutiny of scripture. We're told in the scriptures to test all things. And when we do that, then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Matt Dillahunty is not being intellectually honest uh, with the topic of the Bible, the things that take place in the Bible. Again, he's cherry picking and looking for the worst possible things that God has done in order to destroy your faith. Another really important truth that people need to remember when you're dealing with atheists, every time they spend, they spend their energy attacking God and his nature and attacking um, the nature of, uh, of his only begotten son, our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. They take the onus off themselves as being sinners. The Bible says in Romans 3, uh, 23, that we have all sinned and has fallen short of the glory of God. In Romans 6, it talks about um, that the wages of our sin is death, but the free gift of eternal life is Jesus Christ, our Lord. Every time we spend our time trying to prove to a person that God exists, or we spend our time defending God's nature, who he is, whether he's good or bad or whatever, it takes the onus off of the person that you're talking to. Matt Dillahunty will, will openly admit that he's lied before. Matt Dillahunty 
um, will openly admit that he has not been faithful to his wife all the time, especially if we're looking at it according to the scriptures. Matt Delahunty will admit that he has maybe taken something small from somebody who it didn't necessarily belong to him, which would be stealing regardless. There's a plethora of things that we can point out in the scripture that Matt Delahunty has done that violates God's standard. But if, again, if he puts all of the uh, accusations on God and we never talk about him, it gets him away from hearing the actual gospel. The reality is that the God that we serve is a holy God. He is a loving God. He is a caring God, a merciful God. He is a God that desires that all might be saved and that none might perish. When he created the lake of fire, he created it for the devil and his angels. He did not create it for man originally. But the Bible does say that if the blind leads the blind, then they both will fall into the ditch. If we choose to reject Jesus Christ and his offer of salvation and the forgiveness of our sins, then we will, then we will end up in the same place as Satan. And only a person who actually understands scripture will understand what, what's just been said. Again, Matt Delahunty claimed he had 25 years, 25 years of study, and he doesn't even grasp the basics of the gospel. The only immoral monsters that has ever existed has been man. Man is responsible for two world wars, a civil war. We, uh, in the last 100 years, uh, atheists have killed over 100 million people uh, between uh, Joseph Stalin, uh, Mao, and other atheist dictators. We have created the nuclear bomb. We have created diseases that all it has to do is touch the, touch the ground and people will start foaming at the mouth. We've created viruses that could kill people instantly or torture them for years before they die. We have poisoned our waters. We have poisoned our air. Mankind has done some really sick and disgusting things to each other. But instead of him talking about that, he wants to point out that God is an immoral monster without stating any facts whatsoever, without doing any proper exegesis, without digging into the scriptures to see whether or not the claim that he was making is actually true. This is the kind of individual that we have to deal with when you're calling in to the atheist experience or you're attempting to have a conversation with him. And he will not acknowledge that mankind is some really sick people uh, on this planet and that we need a savior. And that savior is Christ Jesus, the one who died on the cross for us more than 2000 years ago. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. Yes, God loves his creation. We are the ones who screwed up. And he is the one that made a provision for us to be saved. Despite what this devil worshiping fallen individual has to say on his show. And in closing, I just want to say this as a black man living in the United States of America whose ancestors have actually been through the transatlantic slave trade. I find it appalling and I find it very disrespectful that a man like this would pretend to care about slavery in America and what actually happened here. Because if this man really cared about what actually happened here in America, this man would be open to having a debate or a conversation with an African American like myself or other African Americans who have strong opinions about this topic as well. I don't like it when people get on here and they pretend to care about these topics when they really don't. If you agree with me, please leave a comment in the comment section a little bit later when you're done watching this documentary. Faith as a foundation for belief. But what does that word mean? What does it mean to say you have faith? Now, I was a fundamentalist Christian for nearly 25 years. I walked down the aisle at the age of five, accepted Jesus into my heart. I was active in the church. Uh, I wasn't perfect. I wasn't uh, gung-ho for God and Jesus all of the time, but I was in church regularly, and I heard the word faith probably thousands of times, and I was convinced that I knew what it meant. We all did. I knew how we used the term. I, I understood that, according to Hebrews 11.1, 1, faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things unseen. But what does that mean? And as it turns out, there's so many different usages for the word faith that it's difficult to have any sort of conversation about it. 
not only are you in this position where it appears to people that you have abandoned reason in favor of gullibility or incredulity, but that you're using a term that we don't even know what the meaning is. So let's take a look at faith today. Well, number one, it starts with faith. And two... Why would you, why would you believe ways, anything? I, we're, we're done at number one. We're done at number one. Why would you believe yeah, anything? Faith is a good way to be wrong. Is there any is there <laughs> any position <laughs> is there any position yeah. that that I couldn't take based on faith? Couldn't, is there any position that you could that you could not take based on faith? Right. If you begin with faith, couldn't I believe all those gods you just dismissed, or couldn't I pick one of those gods you dismissed and believe it based on faith as a, as a primary foundation? You could, yeah. Sure. So doesn't that mean that faith is not a good foundation for determining what's true or not true? Not so. It, okay, it's, that so, is not what it means. So faith, faith can be used to both believe a true thing and a not true thing. And you yeah. think that this doesn't demonstrate that faith is an unreliable path to truth? Well, the Bible says that faith pleases God. I, I, and uh, Jesus said to Thomas. I, I, I asked Thomas a different question. Jesus, I, asked, I don't know why you're going to the Bible at all. Isn't it ironic that the same people that want evidence for everything and proof for everything are the same people that refuse to go to an objective source to get their definitions? What is the definition of faith? We're going to answer that question. Thankfully, the Bible contains a clear definition of faith in Hebrews 11.1. 1. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Simply put, the biblical definition of faith is trusting in something you cannot explicitly prove. This definition of faith contains two aspects, intellectual assent and trust. Intellectual assent is believing something to be true. Trust is actually relying on the fact that something is true. A chair is often used to help illustrate this. Intellectual assent is recognizing that a chair is a chair and agreeing that it is designed to support a person who sits on it. Trust is actually sitting in the chair. Understanding these two aspects of faith is crucial. Many people believe certain facts about Jesus Christ. Many people will intellectually agree with the facts that the Bible declares about Jesus. But knowing those facts to be true is not what the Bible means by faith. The biblical definition of faith requires intellectual assent to the facts and trust in the facts. Believing that Jesus is God incarnate who died on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins and was resurrected is not enough. Even the demons believe in God and acknowledge those facts. We must personally and fully rely on the death of Christ as the atoning sacrifice for our sins. We must 
sit in the chair of salvation that Jesus Christ has provided. This is saving faith. The faith God requires of us for salvation is belief in what the Bible says about who Jesus is and what he accomplished and fully trusting in Jesus for that salvation. Biblical faith is always accompanied by repentance. The biblical definition of faith does not apply only to salvation. It is equally applicable to the rest of the Christian life. We are to believe what the Bible says and we are to obey it. We are to believe the promises of God and are to live accordingly. We are to agree with the truth of God's word and we are to allow ourselves to be transformed by it. Why is this definition of faith so important? Why must trust accompany agreeing with facts? Because without faith, it is impossible to please God. Without faith, we cannot be saved. Without faith, the Christian life cannot be what God intends it to be. That answers the question, what is the definition of faith? How do you uh, concisely show an atheist or agnostic that uh, they hold beliefs as well? So a lot of times they just say that those are you just have beliefs and I don't have those beliefs. But how do you um, concisely just in one statement show them that they actually hold beliefs and that those uh, beliefs are blind faith? Well, you'd have to be on some sort of topic like, uh, do you believe, I might ask them, do you believe there's an immaterial realm or do you believe everything's just made of molecules? I would just ask that question. If they say everything's just made of molecules, I would ask them, is that statement that you just made made of molecules? So just trying to, again, like you said yesterday, flip the yeah. question on them. Yeah, because everybody, even though they may claim that everything's made of molecules, they don't live like that. Uh, because they don't think, for example, their spouse or their children are just a bag of chemicals. Right. Right? They think that they're special human beings. And they believe in love. In fact, in one of, our, one of the debates I had with Christopher Hitchens, uh, someone from the audience asked Christopher, um, what is love? What is it ontologically? In other words, what, how would you describe love? And Hitchens finally had to admit that according to him, love was a chemical. That it caused you to act in a certain way towards somebody else. And I said, go home and tell that to your wife. Right? <laughs> I just got the chemical today, honey. Tomorrow I might not have it. And if, if that's the case, if you think about this, if love is just a chemical, then how can you hold anybody responsible for anything? In fact, if, if we're not moral creatures that make moral choices, how can we hold anybody morally accountable for everything they do? I mean, Hitler just had bad molecules, right? Yeah. According to that theory of materialism. Exactly. I appreciate it. Thank All you right. much. Thanks, Matt. Before we get into Matt Dillahunty's style of rejecting evidence, uh, let's go over something here real quick, and that's critical thinking. Critical thinking is using rational thought and logic to analyze information and to make reasonable decisions or conclusions based on facts and evidence. Most atheists will, will say that they're critical thinkers, including Matt Dillahunty. Some synonyms for the words uh, for, for critical thinking is discerning, analytical, uh, being exacting, or being open-minded. You know, these are other words that we can use when we're talking about um, being a, a critical thinker. And we know that Christians have to be this way because we're even told in the scriptures not to believe everybody that comes to us claiming that they're speaking for God. A denialist is someone or somebody who's practicing denialism is someone uh, who refuses to accept well-established theory, law or evidence. I'll repeat this again. A denialist or somebody who's into denialism is someone who refuses to accept to accept well-established theory, law, or evidence. And I have a little video clip here that our R.C. Sproul put together. I want you guys to take a look at it so you can see what I'm talking about. There is no such thing as an elephant. But why am I seeing an elephant then? You are not seeing an elephant. You are having a hallucination. How do you know it's a hallucination?
because there's no such thing as elephants. But how do you know there's no such thing as an elephant? Because that is not an elephant. That is a pachyderm. There is no such thing as an elephant. But I have a dictionary. And it says right here, this is an elephant. See? There is no reason to consider that an elephant. That is a pachyderm, because there are no elephants. A famous professor of mind control said there are no elephants. Well, has he ever had an elephant? Of course not. They do not exist. But even if they did, he wouldn't want one. Well, maybe he just doesn't like elephants. Oh, that is so typical of you elephant lovers. You will say anything to justify your belief in elephants. You are the one who's refusing to admit there is an elephant in the room. It's not an elephant. It's a pachyderm. If it were an elephant, it would look like this. There's obviously no such thing as an elephant. You are persisting in believing in imaginary creatures. You just held up a cartoon. That's not what a real elephant looks like. The scholar that drew that was an expert on fairy tales. And that is how he drew a picture of an elephant. But a real elephant isn't a fairy tale. Well, it looks like a fairy tale to me. That's because you are intentionally turning it into one. No. That is what elephants are, fairy tales. Let me show you a picture of a real elephant. I have no interest 
in seeing a real elephant. I already know an elephant is a fairy tale. But if you want to show me a pachyderm, that's fine. Just don't call it an elephant because it's not. Okay, okay, here's a picture of a pachyderm. See, I told you there was no such thing as an elephant. Wow, I guess you are right. It does look like a pectoderm, after all. I absolutely love this illustration because it does a really good job of explaining how atheists like Matt Dillon Huffy go about brainwashing people. And what it means to brainwash, it means to make someone believe something by repeatedly telling them that it is true and preventing any other information from reaching them. See, a true critical thinker, a true person that will receive information that is well established, you know what I mean, would be a person that would obviously know that a pachyderm is also an elephant. Okay? Scientifically speaking, they refer to elephants as being pachydermers. However, they're also elephants as well. And telling somebody that they're not elephants is being intellectually dishonest. And although that was, a, that was a fictional example that R.C. Sproul put together, this is precisely what Matt Dillon Huffy does when he's presented with well-established uh, uh, evidence to conclude that a person existed, uh, a person did something in the past, or anything like that. And I'm going to show you a few examples of Matt Dillon Huffy practicing this very thing and trying to brainwash people into believing a lie and not allowing new information to come into the conversation. Well, uh, I just wanted to uh, clarify some things uh, as far as atheist beliefs. I've been watching the show for years now. Uh, one is uh, you believe, uh, well, let me clarify. Do you believe in Jesus that he existed or not existed? Some do, some don't. Yeah. Well, what do you believe? Do you believe he actually existed in history or not? I think that it's very likely that there was a historical figure that the stories are tied to, but we don't know much at all about him. And it may actually have been a, a number of different people uh, molded into one after the fact. I don't, I have no I'm, idea. I'm, okay. un, I'm unconvinced that there was a single individual on which those stories are based. And, and even if we were convinced that there was a single individual, I don't know how we would know anything about that person specifically. Because if you if you go through, for example, the gospel stories and start, uh, there's no way to verify anything. They're right down to you know the name or the date or anything. Well, I mean, a lot of scholars would disagree with that. I mean, uh, and a lot of Christian scholars would. In their role. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, you have university professors who that. They spend their whole life, you know. Uh, you, you do realize there's university professors. You do realize there's university professors who spent their entire life studying this, who also think that Jesus didn't exist. Well, ba basically, my my comment is basically, I, I think if you're going to take the the Jesus misogynist position, it's almost as tenable as taking a flat earth position and well I no actually because we ha we have concrete evidence that the earth isn't flat wouldn't you say right and we, we do have, we have concrete, concrete evidence do we have concrete evidence that jesus existed that is comparable to that for which we have that the earth is is not flat well it it depends we have the letters of paul where he says paul hey, never I met jesus did he well, did paul ever meet jesus the living jesus well, like i if i recall correctly didn't he say he met his brother Okay, so how do you meet the brother of a mythical guy? So, so you've got a bunch of stories 
Do you have anything you other than testimonials? I mean, if, if okay, all we had, no. if all we had to determine that the earth wasn't flat was a handful of people who said that the earth wasn't flat, um, then you'd, you'd be able to compare the two. There's a lot of problems with what Matt Dillahunty and his guests do on the atheist experience. They want to tell you that Jesus um, never um, existed or they don't believe that he ever existed because they don't know. They don't know if they can trust the scriptures. They want to know if there are sources outside of the Bible. Now, Matt Dillahunty knows full well that there are sources outside of the Bible, and we'll cover those later. But this is not critical thinking that he is demonstrating. What we are listening to is classic denialism. It is the refusal to accept well-established theory, law, or evidence. And what I'm going to show you in a moment is evidence outside of the scripture that Jesus of Nazareth actually existed. And this is important because if, if the evidence that I'm showing is true and they meet the rules of historicity, Matt Delahunty is being intellectually dishonest to as many people as possible to get them to believe a lie. But the younger Ananus who, as we said, received the high priesthood, was of a bold disposition and exceptionally daring. He followed the party of the Sadducees, who are severe in judgment above all the Jews, as we have already shown. As therefore Ananus was of such a disposition, he thought he had now a good opportunity, as Festus was now dead, and Albinus was still on the road, so he assembled a council of judges and brought before it the brother of Jesus the so-called Christ, whose name was James, together with some others, and having accused them as lawbreakers, he delivered them over to be stoned. It is the words the so-called Christ that are thought to be interpolated here. Assuming that this passage is even noticed, some writers seem to forget that it exists. But let us consider the arguments for and against regarding this as an interpolation. One. There is no textual evidence against this passage. It is found in every copy of the antiquities we have. This also applies to the larger passage. Some will assert as a counter that there was still sufficient time for an interpolation to occur and not enough textual evidence to prove that it did not, but this amounts to an admission that the textual data, as it stands, favors authenticity. Anything beyond that in these terms is speculation and question begging. 2. There is a specific use of non-Christian terminology, the designation of James, as the brother of Jesus contrasts with Christian practice, of referring to him as the brother of the Lord or brother of the Savior. As in Galatians chapter 1 verse 19 in the New Testament and Eusebius in later history. I saw none of the other apostles, only James the Lord's brother. The passage squares neither with New Testament nor with early patristic usage. 3. We may note the emphasis of the passage. It is not on Jesus or even James, but on Ananus the high priest and the turbulence he caused. There is no praise for James or Jesus. This is not what we would expect if this were an interpolation. 4. Josephus' account of James being stoned is different from the account given by the church historian Hegesippus, who has James being thrown from the roof of the temple. This would be an unlikely move for an interpolator. 5. Neither this passage nor the larger one connects Jesus with John the Baptist, as we would expect from a Christian interpolator. Roman historian and senator Tacitus referred to Christ, his execution by Pontius Pilate, and the existence of early Christians in Rome in one page of his final work. 
Annals Book 15 Chapter 44 The context of the passage is the six-day great fire of Rome that burned much of the city in AD 64 during the reign of Roman Emperor Nero. The passage is one of the earliest non-Christian references to the origins of Christianity, the execution of Christ described in the canonical Gospels, and the presence and persecution of Christians in first-century Rome. Scholars generally consider Tacitus's reference to the execution of Jesus by Pontius Pilate to be both authentic, and of historical value as an independent Roman source. Eddy and Boyd state that it is now firmly established that Tacitus provides a non-Christian confirmation of the crucifixion of Jesus. Historian Ronald Meller has stated that the Annals is Tacitus's crowning achievement, which represents the pinnacle of Roman historical writing. Scholars view it as establishing three separate facts about Rome around AD 60, that there were a sizable number of Christians in Rome at the time, that it was possible to distinguish between Christians and Jews in Rome, and that at the time pagans made a connection between Christianity and Rome and its origin in Roman Judea. The passage and its context, the Annals passage which has been subjected to much scholarly analysis, follows a description of the six-day great fire of Rome that burned much of Rome in July 64 AD. The key part of the passage reads as follows, Consequently, to get rid of the report is Nero fastened the guilt and inflicted the most exquisite tortures on a class hated for their abominations, called Christians by the populace. Christus, from whom the name had its origin, suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of one of our procurators, Pontius Pilatus, and a most mischievous superstition thus checked for the moment again broke out not only in Judea, the first source of the evil, but even in Rome, where all things hideous and shameful from every part of the world find the center and become popular. Accordingly, an arrest was first made of all who pleaded guilty, then, upon their information, an immense multitude was convicted, not so much of the crime of firing the city, as of hatred against mankind. Tacitus then describes the torture of Christians. The exact cause of the fire remains uncertain, but much of the population of Rome suspected that Emperor Nero had started the fire himself. To divert attention from himself, Nero accused the Christians of starting the fire and persecuted them, making this the first documented confrontation between Christians and the authorities in Rome. Tacitus never accused Nero of playing the liar while Rome burned. That statement came from Cassius Dio, who died in the 3rd century. But Tacitus did suggest that Nero used the Christians as scapegoats. No original manuscripts of the annals exist, and the surviving copies of Tacitus' works derive from two principal manuscripts known as the Medician Manuscripts, written in Latin, which are held in the Laurentian Library in Florence, Italy. It is the second Medician Manuscript, 11th century and from the Benedictine Abbey at Monte Cassino, which is the oldest surviving copy of the passage describing Christians. Scholars generally agree that these copies were written at Monte Cassino and the end of the document refers to Abbas Reynaldus C.U., who was most probably one of the two abbots of the name at the abbey during that period. Authenticity and historical value. Most modern scholars consider the passage to be authentic. William L. Portier has stated that the consistency in the references by Tacitus, Josephus and the letters to Emperor Trajan by Pliny the Younger reaffirm the validity of all three accounts. Scholars generally consider Tacitus's reference to be of historical value as an independent Roman source about early Christianity that is in unison with other historical records.
Tacitus was a patriotic Roman senator. His writings show no sympathy towards Christians, or knowledge of who the leader was. His characterization of Christian abominations may have been based on the rumors in Rome that during the Eucharist rituals Christians ate the body, and drank the blood of the God, interpreting the ritual as cannibalism by Christians. Andreas Kostenberger states that the tone of the passage towards Christians Christians is far too negative to have been authored by Christian scribe. The Van Vorst also states that the passage is unlikely to be a Christian forgery because of the pejorative language used to describe Christianity. Tacitus was about seven years old at the time of the Great Fire of Rome, and like other Romans as he grew up he would have most likely heard about the fire that destroyed most of the city, and Nero's accusations against Christians. When he wrote his account, Tacitus was the governor of the province of Asia, and as a member of the inner circle in Rome he would have known of the official position with respect to the fire and the Christian in 1885 p. Hotchart had proposed that the passage was a pious fraud, but the editor of the 1907 Oxford edition dismissed his suggestion and treated the passage as genuine. Scholars such as Bruce Chilton, Craig Evans, Paul R. Eddy and Gregory A. Boyd agree with John Mayer's statement that, despite some feeble attempts to show that this text is a Christian interpolation in Tacitus, the passage is obviously genuine. Quote, However, Richard Carrier argues that the phrase the founder, one Christ, had been put to death by the procurator, Pontius Pilate in the reign of Tiberius in the passage is a Christian interpolation. He argues that even if the phrase is totally genuine, it is likely that Tacitus is merely repeating what Christians believe. Carrier also argues that there is a strange gap in the annals of Tacitus for the period of middle 29 to middle 31 and cites Robert Dreher's suggestion that the period was cut because it provided no information regarding Jesus. Suggestions that the whole of annals may have been a forgery have also been generally rejected by scholars. John P. Mayer states that there is no historical or archaeological evidence to support the argument that a scribe may have introduced the passage into the text. The Van Voorst states that, of all Roman writers, Tacitus gives us the most precise information about Christ. John Dominic Crossan considers the passage important in establishing that Jesus existed and was crucified, and states that he was crucified as as sure as anything historical can ever be, since both Josephus and Tacitus agree with the Christian accounts on at least that basic fact. Eddie and Boyd state that it is now firmly established that Tacitus provides a non-Christian confirmation of the crucifixion of Jesus. Biblical scholar Bart D. Ehrman wrote, Tacitus's report confirms what we know from other sources, that Jesus was executed by order of the Roman government governor of Judea, Pontius Pilate, sometime during Tiberius's reign. James D. G. Dunn considers the passage as useful in establishing facts about early Christians, e.g., that there was a sizable number of Christians in Rome around AD 60. Dunn states that Tacitus seems to be under the impression that Christians were some form of Judaism, although distinguished from them. Raymond E. Brown and John P. May state that in addition to establishing that there was a large body of Christians in Rome, the Tacitus passage provides two other important pieces of historical information, namely that by around AD 60 it was possible to distinguish between Christians and Jews in Rome and that even pagans made a connection between Christianity and Rome and its origin in Judea, although the majority of scholars consider it to be genuine. A few scholars question the authenticity of the passage given that Tacitus was born 25 years after Jesus's death. Some scholars have debated the historical value of the passage given that Tacitus does not reveal the source of his information. Goethe I 
Tasson and Annette Mertz argue that Tacitus at times had drawn on earlier historical works now lost to us, and he may have used official sources from a Roman archive in this case, however, if Tacitus had been copying from an official source, some scholars would expect him to have labelled Pilate correctly as a prefect rather than a procurator. Thyssen and Mertz state that Tacitus gives us a description of widespread prejudices about Christianity and a few precise details about Christus and Christianity, the source of which remains unclear. However, Paul R. Eddy has stated that given his position as a senator Tacitus was also likely to have had access to official Roman documents of the time and did not need other sources. Michael Martin notes that the authenticity of this passage of the Annals has also been disputed on the grounds that Tacitus would not have used the word Messiah in an authentic Roman document. Weaver notes that Tacitus spoke of the person persecution of Christians but no other Christian author wrote of this persecution for a hundred years. Hotamer notes that this passage was not quoted by any church farther up to the 15th century, although the passage would have been very useful to them in the work and that the passage refers to the Christians in Rome being a multitude, while at the time the Christian congregation in Rome would actually have been very small. Scholars have also debated the issue of hearsay in the reference by Tacitus. Charles Quinbit argued that so long as there is that possibility, the passage remains quite worthless. R.T. France states that the Tacitus passage is at best just Tacitus repeating what he had heard through Christians. However, Paul R. Eddy has stated that as Rome's preeminent historian, Tacitus was generally known for checking his sources and was not in the habit of reporting gossip. Tacitus was a member of the Quindecim Viri Sacris Faciundus, a council of priests whose duty it was to supervise foreign religious cults in Rome, which as Van Voorst points out, makes it reasonable to suppose that he would have acquired knowledge of Christian origins through his work with that body. Did Julius Caesar exist? Did Cicero exist? Did Socrates or Aristotle or Mark Antony? Almost no one questions whether these people existed. So why is there so much controversy around the question, did Jesus exist? I can assure you, as a historian, that whatever else you might want to say about Jesus, he certainly existed. The historical Jesus may not have been the person that people imagine today, but he was a real person, and we can know some things about him. You don't have to believe that Jesus was the Son of God in order to accept the facts of history. And that's what I deal with in my book, The Facts. Skeptics like to say that we don't have the original text of any of the Gospels of the New Testament, and we don't have any historical records of Jesus from his day. That's absolutely right, but it's also true of virtually everyone who lived at his time, including such powerful and important figures as Pontius Pilate, the governor of Judea, and Josephus, the Jewish historian. Some of those who claim that Jesus was a myth argue that he was invented along the lines of the gods of pagan mythology, who also died and were resurrected. In my book, I show why that also cannot be correct. The evidence for the historical Jesus, as for Pilate and Josephus, is overwhelming when looked at through the impartial lens of the historian. At the same time, the historical record indicates that Jesus was not who most people believe he was. Like other Jewish preachers of his day, Jesus proclaimed that the world was controlled by forces of evil. But God was soon going to intervene in history. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest, and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus. 
And suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth, and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man. But they led him by the hand, and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and neither did eat nor drink. And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayeth, and hath seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him, that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priests to bind all that call on thy name. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way, and entered into the house, and putting his hands on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, hath sent me, that thou mightest receive thy sight, and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received sight forthwith, and arose, and was baptized. And when he had received meat, he was strengthened, then was Saul certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus, and straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. But all that heard him were amazed and said, Is not this he that destroyed them which called on this name in Jerusalem, and came hither for that intent, that he might bring them bound unto the chief priests? But Saul increased the more in strength, and confounded the Jews which dwelt at Damascus, proving that this is very Christ. And after that many days were fulfilled, the Jews took counsel to kill him. But their laying await was known of Saul. And they watched the gates day and night to kill him. Then the disciples took him by night and let him down by the wall in a basket. And when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he essayed to join himself to the disciples, but they were all afraid of him and believed not that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him, and brought him to the apostles, and declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way, and that he had spoken to him, and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. And he was with them, coming in and going out at Jerusalem. And he spake boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus, and disputed against the Grecians. But they went about to slay him, which when the brethren knew, they brought him down to Caesarea, and sent him forth to Tarsus. Then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria, and were edified, and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost, were multiplied. And it came to pass, as Peter passed throughout all quarters, he came down also to the saints which dwelt at Lydda. And there he found a certain man named Aeneas, which had kept his bed eight years, and was sick of the palsy. And Peter said unto him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ maketh thee whole, arise and make thy bed. And he arose immediately, and all that dwelt at Lydda and Saron saw him and turned to the Lord. Now there was at Joppa a certain disciple named Tabitha, which by interpretation is called Dorcas. This woman was full of good works and alms deeds which she did. And it came to pass in those days that she was sick and died whom when they had washed, they laid her in an upper chamber. 
And for as much as Lydda was nigh to Joppa, and the disciples had heard that Peter was there, they sent unto him two men, desiring him that he would not delay to come to them. Then Peter arose and went with them. When he was come, they brought him into the upper chamber, and all the widows stood by him weeping, and showing the coats and garments which Dorcas made while she was with them. But Peter put them all forth, and kneeled down and prayed. And turning him to the body, said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes. And when she saw Peter, she sat up. And he gave her his hand and lifted her up. And when he had called the saints and widows, presented her alive. And it was known throughout all Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. And it came to pass that he tarried many days in Joppa with one Simon, a tanner. Anybody who believes that Matt Dillahunty is seriously interested in evidence for the existence of God, Jesus, the reliability of the Bible, I'm sorry, but you've been deceived into believing a lie. The man is not interested in these things. This man wants to hear your claim so that he can deny and refuse to accept any well-established theory, law, or evidence. I just gave you three secular sources that mentioned Jesus as a historical figure. An atheist believes that he was a historical figure. He is because he is he's he's a person who studied uh his, the, the historicity of Jesus, and he came to this conclusion. For Matt Dillahunty to be the, to be this dishonest on the atheist experience, because he has the power to hang the phone up on people, and come to the conclusion that uh, Jesus of Nazareth never existed, the end without giving us uh, a guideline for the rules of historicity or anything like that is just completely dishonest. Anybody who's a real person who's interested in actually getting educated about a given topic, that person must have an open mind. That person must have a discerning spirit. And that person must be able to take in the information and then come to a conclusion whether or not he believes he or she is a historical person. If we just allow people to say, oh, I don't believe that he was a historical person, and we don't have any rules of historicity, then he can deny the existence of Adolf Hitler. He can deny the existence of Julius Caesar. He can deny the existence of Abraham Lincoln or any other historical figure. So don't let him get away with stuff like that. Hold his feet to the fire. Make him give you the rules for historicity and how he knows or how he goes about determining what sources are reliable and what sources are not. So let's go over some definitions again. A real critical thinker is someone who, who, who is using rational thought and logic to analyze information and make reasonable decisions or conclusions based on facts and evidence. In order for you to analyze anything, you have to first have the information. And you have to be able to show people these are the rules that I followed and I came to the conclusion that this person existed or they didn't exist. If, a, if you want to know if a person is not doing that, they would fit under this other definition, which would make them not a critical thinker. And that, a, and that is a denialist or the practicing denialism. And that is the refusal to accept well-established theory, law, or evidence. We have shown secular sources, uh, uh, secular historians, who have mentioned Jesus of Nazareth. Bart Ehrman, the atheist, even, even believes that Jesus of, Nazareth, Jesus of Nazareth existed. Now, granted, because of his atheism, his agnostic atheism, he doesn't believe all that Christians believe about Jesus, about his divinity, being the savior, and why he came and everything. But that wasn't the point of showing you that. The point of showing you this was to show you how non-Christians even believe that Jesus of Nazareth existed. Again, there are other religions out there that believe that is completely against Christianity in every which way, form, or whatever, who believe that Jesus of Nazareth actually existed. The New Age movement, for example, believes that Jesus of Nazareth existed. Okay? Muslims believe that Jesus of Nazareth existed. Hindus believe that Jesus of Nazareth existed. Buddhists believe that Jesus of Nazareth existed. And there are a plethora of other religions that believe that Jesus of Nazareth existed based on the available body of facts that we have to determine whether or not we know a historical figure existed. 
Again, the burden is actually on the atheist to be able to show why a document is not reliable. If they cannot do that, they should not be taken seriously. Matt Dillahunty's method of rejecting evidence is totally and completely dishonest. This is not what an open-minded, analytical, discerning person would do when they're having a conversation with somebody about whether or not a proposition is true or whether or not a proposition is false. Again, you have to take in all of the information before you can come to the conclusion that something is right or wrong. And in Matt Dillahunty's case, he does not do that. What's worse is this man brags about being a former Christian for 25 years. He was a Christian for 25 years. I have not been a Christian for 25 years, and I have a better understanding of the scripture than this man does. I know people who have been Christians for seven or eight years that have a better understanding of the Bible than Matt Dillahunty does. And if you remember earlier in the show, when he had a discussion with Matt Slick, he couldn't even answer the very basics of the faith. So why then are we accepting any criticism from Matt Dillahunty regarding our Bibles, our faith, what we believe, if he's not even willing to get his own, uh, uh, get what we believe correct? My conclusion on Matt Dillahunty is this. Uh, I believe that Matt Dillahunty is part of the atheist experience to do what most atheists do on the internet. Matt Dillahunty is only interested in pretending to wanting uh, evidence for the existence of God or the existence of Jesus or anything that we Christians believe to have you call the platform so that he can frustrate you into atheism. The way he goes about doing this is, is by having you present your evidence so he can sit on the judgment seat and say he doesn't believe what you're showing him. He's not convinced without first uh, giving you something back in return on why he's not convinced. Based on factual information and not based on denialism or some other method to frustrate you and make you look like a fool when you're, call when you're calling into a show. I'll give you an example. Uh, you might want to call the show and you want to present your evidence for the existence of God. It could be um, the intelligent design argument. And then you call into the show and the entire time you're speaking to him, he tells you that your evidence is not really evidence. He tells you your evidence doesn't have the power to convince anybody. He'll try to dominate the conversation and tell you that those are not the meaning of the words, even though you have a dictionary in front of you. But even more importantly than that, he'll deny or will not accept any established theory, law, or evidence that you have for why you believe in Christ and why it is reasonable for other people to believe in Christ. What you need to remember is when you're talking to a person like this is once you see that this person is not listening to you, this person is misrepresenting you in the scriptures that it's time for you to wipe the dust off your feet and move on. It's one thing to disagree with somebody about something that they believe. It's another thing to completely misrepresent what a person actually believes. For example, we Christians do not go around teaching people that you can have slaves and give the rules on slavery. Yet, every time Matt Delahunty gets into a moral dilemma argument with somebody, he loves to bring up the slavery issue. He forgets that these laws were made for ancient Israel. Or, maybe he hasn't forgotten and is looking to try to discredit Christianity as much as possible. Remember earlier in this documentary, we talked about what anti-theism was and what uh, misotheism was. Misotheism is the hatred of God, in short. Uh, anti-theism is the it means to be opposed to religion or to be opposed to a person who believes that a God exists. When Matt Dillahunty is mentioning slavery and he's talking about the things that he's talking about on the atheist experience, he's not demonstrating actual knowledge of what the Bible says according to theologians who have actually studied the Bible. 
the experts. He does that when it comes to science, but he will not do that when it comes to the Bible. He lies about there being multiple uh, uh, multiple different versions of Christianity when I've shown you guys earlier in this documentary that what we have is different denominations. And it is not the same thing as different versions of Christianity. And this is important. Because the longer you talk to a person like that, that is willfully lying to you uh, about the information of what it is that you believe, the more you put yourself in danger of being deceived. If you're going to speak to a person like this, pray before you do it, fast before you do it, get your head right and know what you believe and why you believe it. Because if you don't, then you're going to end up in a conversation with somebody like this and you're going to find out that Satan has different voices and you're going to understand why he was so, why he was so uh, able to deceive so many of the angels that was in heaven and why he's able to deceive so many people here on the earth using people like Matt Dillahunty. If you are convicted by what you saw in this brief documentary on Matt Dillahunty, there's a message for you at the end of this video. There is one God and he is the maker of heaven and earth. And he made us in his image and likeness, male and female, with dignity, value, worth, and purpose. He made us to worship. And we chose to sin against him, to rebel against him, to disobey him. As a result, we are separated from God and we live under the foolish myth that to some degree, we are each our own God, declaring right and wrong and living our own life by our own standards. And that God lovingly came into human history as the man Jesus Christ, fully God, fully man. That he was born of a virgin and he lived a life without sin, though he was tempted in every way as we are. And he went to the cross and there he substituted himself. Our first parents in the garden substituted themselves for God. And at the cross, Jesus reversed that substitution and substituted himself for sinners. And when Jesus went to the cross, he took willingly upon him the sin of those who would come to trust in him. That means me. As a sinner, Jesus went to the cross and took upon himself all my sin, past, present, and future. And Jesus Christ, God, who was a man, died in my place for my sins, paying my debt to God and purchasing my salvation. Jesus' dead body was then laid in a tomb, and for three days he was buried. On the third day, a Sunday, which is why we worship on that day, Jesus rose in victory over Satan, sin, death, demons, and hell. And he commissioned us with the Holy Spirit to be missionaries telling this amazingly good news that there's a God who passionately, lovingly, continually, relentlessly pursues us. And he ascended into heaven and today Jesus is alive and well and he's seated on a throne and he is ruling and reigning over all nations and all cultures and all philosophies and all races and all periods of time. And he is King of Kings and he is Lord of Lords and he is ruling and reigning over all people, commanding everyone everywhere to repent of everything. And he is coming again to judge the living and the dead and those who trust in him will enjoy eternity in his kingdom of heaven forever. And those who do not will suffer apart from him in the conscious eternal torments of hell. That is what we believe. We believe in Jesus.